care yet. Might as well be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they said 41 on the TV like 100 really times today. They said what? 41 on the TV like 100 times. I don't watch TV during the day. Oh, it must have not been. I wasn't watching TV. It must have been on the radio. Good evening and welcome to the uh, workshop meeting of the Town Council of Monday, December 3rd. Let's begin the meeting, please, with a moment of silence in remembrance of the 41st President of the United States, George Bush. Thank you. Councillor Breton, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councilor Breton? Here. Councilor Forrest? Here. Councilor Hurley? Here. Councilor Latina? Here. Councilor Lesser? Here. Councilor Rao? Here. Councilor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And Mayor Moore and Bello? Here. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, first, we have a presentation tonight by our police chief to discuss public safety in town. So we'd ask Chief Citran to come on up. After the police chief speaks, we'll have a few words from our legislative delegation. I see Representative Morin and, and Guerrera in the audience. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. There's crime. Uh, there's crime in Wethersfield. There's crime in every place else in the state of Connecticut, too. What's in particular is the juvenile crime that seems to have exponentially gone up quite a bit, especially in the last couple of years. The state of Connecticut has closed uh, correctional facilities for juveniles, so a lot of them aren't really getting processed through the system, and they're actually um, on the streets. And they continue to stay on the streets. We've actually arrested some of the kids with ankle bracelets on, indicating that they're on probation or parole. Um, the kids know this too, and they, I think that's one of the reasons why they're acting out so much. Um, they don't seem to have any fear. They don't seem to have, definitely don't have any good judgments and some of the crimes that they've committed seem to be now ex escalating. <clears throat> what we had is a, a huge rash of car breaks, and they were going around at night onto pe people's property, going through the driveways, looking for cars that were unlocked, and they'd rifle through the cars. If people kept valuables in the cars, they would steal them. If they left the keys in the car, they would steal the car itself. I do have some statistics here that kind of indicates what's going on. In 2017, car breaks in Wethersfield, we had 381. Newington had 203. Rocky Hill had 166. Berlin, 134. West Hartford, 776. Glastonbury, 229. Bloomfield, 212. The car thefts themselves, Wethersfield, this is 2017, we had 91 car thefts. Newington had 90, Rocky Hill had 31, Berlin had 25, West Hartford had 149. West Hartford seems to be a popular target for some of these kids. Uh, Glastonbury had 50 and Bloomfield had 53. Now in 2018, we are in the last month of 2018, but we haven't gotten a full 12 months out of it yet. We've gone way down on the car breaks, 194 versus last year, 381. Newington, though, has 207. Rocky Hill, 138. Berlin, 89. West Hartford went down quite a bit, too, but still had 561 car breaks this year. Glastonbury, 167. 
Bloomfield 229. Car thefts in Wethersfield this year, 70, Newington 68, Rocky Hill 58, Berlin 23, West Hartford 161, Glastonbury 55, and Bloomfield 56. But the one statistic that I think is very telling uh, is um, what is happening with the kids when they steal the cars. We've actually uh, cornered some of them on our streets, but they drive like maniacs. In 2014, we had four pursuits for the entire year. In 2015, we had six. 2016, we had 22. In 2017, we were up to 42 pursuits. In 2018, we're well over 50 now, and we're not finished with the year yet. Now, you have to understand what the definition of a pursuit is, because it's not like it used to be when I was in patrol, when we had horses and carriages. <laughs> <laughs> the pursuits were a lot better those in those days. But what we had, what we have here, as soon as an officer puts on his lights and tries to stop a car, if that car maintains speed or increases speed, that falls under the definition of a pursuit. So it's classified as a pursuit. However, what's, what's happened is that the people who are in these cars drive crazy. I mean, absolutely crazy. They'll do a, we had one a car that was actually clocked on Ridge Road doing 102 miles an hour. And he was not stopping for the stop signs up there. So they, they'll stop the pursuit. The sergeant either stop the pursuit or the officer himself will stop the pursuit. So what we have here is now you've got a car heading towards Hartford at an extreme rate of speed, and there's no cruiser behind it, but they don't slow down. And then a lot of times, not a lot of times, but many times, those cars then get involved in accidents in Hartford. Hartford has a serious problem, to say the least, because of these things and the fact that um, most of the stolen cars that I was referring to from all these other suburban towns end up in Hartford. That's where the cars are being recovered. Uh, <clears throat> the crimes do seem to be escalating. We all have heard about the, the boy, the 13-year-old at the, the bus stop. That's an escalation. Two cars were stolen out of a driveway in West Hartford with the keys in the car. They were running, warming up. The two cars then came into Wethersfield 40 minutes later and were cruising our streets and they saw that 13-year-old boy at the bus stop alone. Decided uh, one of the kids got out of the car, went up to the boy. There were seven kids in those two cars. Uh, one of one of the boys got out of the car, walked up to the 13-year-old, and, and told him to give him his phone. The boy said no, and he proceeded to knock him down and punch and kick him until he got his phone and he got his backpack. We later recovered that car. Actually, Harford recovered that car on Wethersfield Avenue. The backpack was still in the car with the Chromebook, still in it. They never even took the Chromebook. So obviously they didn't care about the Chromebook, but they did care about that phone. We had a, a robbery, an armed robbery last year, um, kind of significant because what happened was uh, the guy and his wife pull into a parking lot in one of the apartment complexes. They get out of their car. Car pulls up behind them, blocks their car in. Kid jumps out with a gun in his hand, goes up and tells the husband, give me your phone. He does. He then goes to the woman, who was six or seven months pregnant, says, give me your phone, and she says no, with a gun in his hand. Uh, he pushed her, he grabbed her breast, grabbed her phone, and jumped back into the car. Two days later, that boy was involved in a shooting in New Britain, where he got shot in the leg by a police officer. That police officer was out of work for quite a while while the, the investigation was going on. But these are the kind of activities occurring. Last night, I told the manager last night that we had a, a similar situation on Fairway Drive. A man goes, lives on, in the apartments on Fairway Drive, 
drives to the Walcott Hill Deli to get a pack of cigarettes. He says he notices a, a black Mercedes flying up Wilkett Hill Road, but as soon as it went past the deli, it slowed down and came to a stop and pulled into the parking lot. So he was watching it. He was wondering what was going on. Kid gets out of the car, looks at him. He really doesn't think that much of it. Gets in his car and then drives back to Fairway Drive. When he pulls into the parking lot, parks his car, he looks up and he sees that same black Mercedes coming down you know, the driveway. So he now knows there's something wrong. So he runs. It's a smart thing to do. And he tries to, he gets into the foyer of the apartment, but he can't get the key to unlock his door because he was nervous. Kid comes up behind him. He's got a ski mask on, a handgun in his right hand, and tells him to give him his keys. He says no. Second, two, two more kids now come in, both wearing ski masks, both have guns in their hands, and they proceeded to beat the guy and grab his keys and take him. He is extremely lucky that they didn't shoot and kill him. Because <clears throat> later that night, maybe three or four hours later, there was a car crash on Farmington Avenue in Hartford near Aetna. No reason. They must have been driving crazy, drove off the road, and crashed into something on the side. A Harper cop is driving up. He sees now four guys get out of that car and run towards Aetna, uh, actually into the parking garage there. Just by luck, there was two straight troopers, Capitol Police officer, and he called for help from other Harford officers, so they surrounded the place. They found the four kids in the uh, garage, and they, <clears throat> uh, after short struggles, they actually made the apprehension. They recovered the ski mask out of the car. They recovered three handguns in the parking garage. One of the kids had two magazines for 9 millimeter and a bunch of loose 38 caliber rounds. All three of the guns were loaded. One was a 38, two were 9 millimeter. So they had enough ammunition to wage a small war if they wanted to. One of those kids, we believe, is the one that actually did the robbery of the 13-year-old at the bus stop. It's going to be a hard case to make because we don't have forensics, we don't have eyewitnesses, and uh, you know there's no fingerprints or DNA or anything that we can use from that type of a crime. Um, the boy will be shown you know, photographic lineups, but um, we don't have much confidence in that. But uh, it's, it's pretty, we're pretty sure that this is a kid, based on the description and, and what the kids have said, which isn't a lot. But they're, they're just to make a kind of carte blanche statements is that, yes, crime is up. Crime does go up and down. It really does. But it seems to be worse now because of the the juvenile justice system, the way it's set up now, there's not um, a lot of deterrence to some of these kids, at least in their minds, to committing these crimes. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer any. Or if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about. Um, <clears throat> do counselors have questions for the police chief? Do you want to go with the delegation first? That's fine. Okay. There are oh, I have a question. Okay. Are you doing anything differently now that that happened to the 13-year-old? Yes, we have. Well, we've done a lot of things differently from the very beginning. Because of the fact that what was occurring, <clears throat> most of our directed patrols, which used to be on the Salisine Highway and the Berlin Turpic on the overnight shift because of the burglaries and the convenience stores that are open that we'd have robberies at and so on and so forth, were redirected into the neighborhoods because of the cars that were being broken into. Um, and we only have so many resources, so that's where they were redirected. And that's one of the reasons why we, I believe that, why we cut back on a significant number of those car breaks, because our presence in the neighborhoods were being seen. We actually, well, I can give you a perfect example. Uh, one of our officers was driving up well, Wells Road 1, 1.30 in the morning, and what they're looking for is the, the taillights. 
and he spots taillights up Knight Street. And you don't know Knight Street. Knight Street goes to an end, and it's L, and there's a cul-de-sac on the other. I don't remember the name of that street, but uh, what he did was he drove up there. When he gets there, he now turns left and sees that cul-de-sac. There's two cars with no lights on, but running around that area. When he goes to stop them, he says he's, he fears he's got a pretty good shot at this because they got to come out of that cul-de-sac and come back down that road. So he pulls the cruiser up and blocks it. Well, that meant nothing because they drove over across the, the lawns. God knows what, if there was anything on those lawns, including people or dogs or cats or anything, they would have been killed. But they drove. They, what ends up happening now is they come back out, they go back to Wells Road, and they head west. The officer comes out. He's heading west at Ridge, uh, at Wells and Ridge. One keeps going straight. One takes a right and, and takes Ridge Road. The officer goes after the car that takes the right. Now, they're going pretty fast. When he gets to the Hartford line, he's already lost sight of them, and he breaks off the pursuit, but proceeds into Hartford to see if maybe the car was across, you know, not too far over the line. He doesn't find it. He comes back. He's headed back now south on Maple Ave. When he gets to that section where there's a median right at the line, right across from Cedar Crest Cemetery, uh, he sees a car headed north at a high rate of speed. You can tell by the the jiggling of the headlights. That car now shifts over into the southbound lanes, headed northbound, directly at him, head on. He had to drive into the cemetery to avoid being struck by that car. That was the car that kept going west on Wells Road. I, I can't, I know I'm not probably explaining it well enough, but you have to understand there's not much judgment in these individuals. They, they don't fear, they're not afraid of, of crashing or dying because I don't think they understand what the concept is. They drive like maniacs. None of these kids have driver's licenses. I remember I heard somebody say, why don't they take their licenses away from them? They don't have licenses. Some of the statements that they've made is kind of scary, you know. It's not my car. What do I care? Or things like, uh, we know as soon as we drive crazy, you'll back off. Uh, but it's the way it is. I don't know how else to, I can't really sugarcoat it. It's, it's, we, we have a problem, and it's statewide. It's not just Wethersfield. It's all across the state. I, I'm the president of the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association, so I go to a lot of the meetings across the state. Every chief is saying the same thing. Every neighborhood is, is being hit with these kids that are doing this. Uh, I hope I answered your question. You did. Thank you. Before we take more questions, why don't we have the, um, the delegation get up if, if speak. Do you, would you mind coming up now and giving a few words, and then we'll... Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Senator Doyle, welcome. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Representative Guerrero for a short period of time. I know my colleague here, Carrie Wood, who's... Uh, the new elected 29th will soon be taking over in January. But um, to the chief's point here, um, we, we're here, as obviously I'll let Representative Morris and uh, Senator Doyle speak uh, on this issue. But as a, as a representative that represents Newington, Wethersfield, and Rocky Hill, and I do do a lot of work in the city of Hartford too, this is an epidemic that is going on right now. And unfortunately what's happening from what my understanding is, a lot of these youngsters are under 16, 15 years old. And a lot of gangs recruit these individuals too because what they do is they know that if they get in trouble that they're not going to face any basically jail time. They're going to be right back out in the streets again. And that's why, that's why I'm seeing a rise when I talk to uh, police officers in Hartford, whatever it is, Rocky Hill or Newington. It's all over. The chief's absolutely right. It's throughout the whole state of Connecticut right now. So, you know, we're very lucky that, you know, you have a great police department, a, a good chief, and so does Rocky Hill and Newington. But it's something I think that we're going to, the future, obviously, legislators may have to look at this, how we can tighten this loophole up. And, you know, when you talk to prosecutors about this, too, it's that they're flooded, too. They're flooded. And so what do you do with a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old? Do you, you know, do you put them in jail? Do you, you know, do you try to give them another chance? And that's obviously that they do. 
but unfortunately they go home to sometimes broken homes, nobody there, and you know they get recruited as a gang member or whatever it is, and they go right back and do it again. And it's an unfortunate thing. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Deputy Mayor and Town Councilors. Good to see all of you, uh, members of the public. Russ Morin, I'm the State Representative for Wethersfield, the 28th District. And uh, Chief, I, first of all, um, I think you know this, and you have uh, at least one officer in the crowd. Uh, we certainly uh, value and appreciate all the work that the Wethersfield Police Department does, the men and women, Wethersfield PDR uh, tops, uh, for sure in the region and probably in the state. So, uh, And I know you have uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, the, the morning after the young, young man was accosted on Yale Street, I was... Uh, stopping into a convenience store and one of your officers <laughs> some somebody was there with their car running in front of the store and the doors were unlocked and your officer went in and you know talked to the person and like a public service uh, announcement and i it was like this is you know kind of sad with all the press that's going on but goes to show uh, and he was very polite and just reminding this person in town that it's dangerous i'm you know, when I heard the story about the young boy, 13 years old, I believe, it, you know, it sickens, sickens me. My kids are older now and, and uh, grown up, but I have grandchildren that live in this town. And uh, everybody else's kids are equally as important. And it's, I guess, I, I'm not sure even that there's anything that can be said, except I need to hear more from, from you, Chief. When, when you talked about the young man, uh, that was in the black Mercedes, and you, you believe he's the one that went after the, the our 13-year-old boy. Uh, did did you guys get an age on this guy? Do you how old? He's 16. So, I've already talked. Um, Senator Fonfair and I have, have discussed this matter uh, because it's troubling. Obviously, uh, I, I know some parents are here, and I'm I'm actually uh, glad to see some parents here. Sorry that you're here, but. It's important. And I talked to Senator Fonfair. I've also spoken with uh, Majority Leader Ritter to talk about any possibilities of things uh, we, we could do if there's things at the state level. Frankly, um, you know, if you listen to some people, no matter what you do for laws, it, it won't stop certain behaviors. But I think it's Wethersfield has the charm of, of being, you know, a beautiful community to raise your families, and I think people are afraid. And that's not a good feeling. And um, I'm looking forward. I, I would uh, welcome working with the council and with, with you, Chief, to, to get the statistics and to try to uh, work if there's legislation that can be passed uh, to, to help. Obviously, uh, the Police Chiefs uh, Association is very active at the state capitol. Uh, I, I imagine I don't sit on the Judiciary Committee, but... Um, I'm sure it's something that we'll get some some discussion this year, and it's it's a, a bit disheartening. And I, I know you all are doing everything you can. Uh, the, the I think the concern is, and I hear it from people, is you know we would like more more feet on the ground and more things. And, and I remember one time many years ago when I had the pleasure of sitting uh, at that dais listening to you were here and, and talking about, you know, how you could have a, an officer on almost every corner and things could still happen, and that's a frustrating problem. I know for you and the men and women of the police department and the, and the residents, so um, I'm, I'm committed to working with all of you to, to try to do what we can at, from our level. Um, I'm, it's kind of sad that two of my colleagues won't be here, but uh, Car Carrie Wood out there, I know she's going to be uh, ready to step right in and, and work with us as well. And I encourage you to reach out to her and, and make sure you get to know her. Um, and I look forward to listening, especially uh, to the senators. Uh, they both have different perspectives and probably very good perspectives on what we can do and, and can't do. And I just promise that we'll continue to work with all of you to try to do, to do what's best uh, for the people of Wethersfield. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, like Representative Guerrero, my career is winding down, but I'm currently chairman of the Judiciary Committee. This is an issue I've been talking to the Chief about for years. And um, I'm a little, I was 
outnumbered a minority, but I think this is, I kind of foresaw this several years ago. I think the genesis of the whole problem is this raise to age movement that the chief said. Um, prior to the f first legislation passed maybe three or four years ago, age, r the age of juvenile was under 16. So basically, when you're, under, when you're in juvenile, the court system treats you differently. And I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, it's, it's appropriate in certain, certain circumstances. But a few years ago, we raised the age to under 18. So now 16 and 17 year olds are part of the juvenile court system. So there's a lot, there's a lot of belief out there. The, the recent rise in crime is related to the lack of um, enforcement and it's not going to the regular superior court. So that's a lot of us believe in. I mean, I'll be honest, I did not support the raise the age, you know, four years ago. I opposed it for this reason. Um, but it's a strong movement at the Capitol. It got through, it passed on a bipartisan vote, so it's not even a partisan issue. As chairman of the committee, I opposed it. I think it's a wrong move. And then a few years ago, many of you were aware, I made a very controversial budget vote um, for a lot of reasons. A lot of people didn't like it, my colleagues, my party. But in that, that was a, a provision was inserted into that to raise the age to under 21. So that would have brought 19 and 20 year olds into this to make them treated in the juvenile court system. So I think that would make this problem worse, I firmly believe, because some have postulated it makes them more attractive for gangs because you're not going to be prosecuted. People will disagree with me. Uh, that's my belief, and because I believe the criminal court system still treats people first-time offenders, even if you're 16 or 17 in the old system. If you're not a repeat offender, you're going to get a. You're, you're not going to be thrown in prison. It was. I mean, I practice criminal law, but it's my concern. Four years ago, it's my concern in the new legislature, and we have a new rep there. I hope when this issue is going to come up, it will come up this year to raise the age to under 21. There was a strong two years ago. It was in that budget that I, I voted against and supported the other one. That one was of the motivations. It was slipped in there in the, 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 the uh, at, at night. But none of my colleagues here had anything to do with it. The the pr presenter really pushed it, and that's going to be back next year. So I would just think. Um, the new legislature has to consider this because, again, this is not just a Weathersfield problem. It's a statewide problem, and I just hope the new legislature will analyze it and try to look at the actual criminal numbers and be able to maybe step back, certainly not raise the age anymore, and then reconsider, maybe come to try to reform the piece of legislation in the current legislature because it's a scary time, and I agree with the comments of the chief, and we've been talking about it for several years. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'll be the first to say this is not my area of expertise, but it's clearly an important issue not only to folks in town, but to, as Paul just said, this is an issue that um, is of concern around the state. The challenge is to find a balance, frankly, of um, recognizing what um, incarcerating or uh, having someone have a record at a very young age does to their lives with ensuring public safety. Anytime you have a, a law or not a law um, where folks of any age feel that they can do something with impunity, you're going to see abuse of that. Um, I deal with that on a regular basis in Hartford with respect to, uh, to uh, ATVs and street bikes. Harvard Police does not, I, don't, I think Weathersfield may have a similar policy. They don't chase um, folks on ATVs and street bikes. And so these guys know it. They drive up to a cop, give them the finger, whatever, drive off. And, um, and because they know that there's a no chase policy. I don't know all the facts on how this change in the law, changing the age is impacting communities, but I commit to you that I will learn what it is, what its effect is statewide. And to the extent that there needs to be some modification that sends the proper signal that we don't want to have young people have uh, having um, essentially a weight around them because they had an indiscretion but that does not and should not mean that someone can act with impunity, whether it's in this case or any case, where there aren't consequences for their action. That balance has to be struck, and I don't know if we're there right now with the current law. But I will do my homework, 
and and um, I will be glad. I'm sure that Russ, Kerry, and others will be glad to come back as we get into the session and update you as to where we are, and um, and see if there are some alternatives, some approaches, some modifications to the current law that a makes sense, and b the chances of us achieving passage of that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any counselors who have questions now for either the police chief or our delegation? Councilor Rell? Or the chief. Chief, was the car that was used for the, uh, um, the assault on the 13-year-old, was that a stolen car? Yes, they were stolen out of West Hartford. Out of, out of West Hartford. Um, and I know, you know, I don't know who it is in the police department, but they're doing a pretty good job of the PSAs on social media. Um, you know, I got to give credit where it's due. You guys do a pretty good job. You know, I try to read it as much as I possibly can, and it seems like a lot of the comments people are saying, you know, oh, well, you know, it's your fault because you left your car running, or it's your fault because you ran into the dry cleaners real quick, you left your car running or your keys in the car. Or, or if the car's not even running, it's just in your driveway and you feel secure. <clears throat> but looking at where some of these incidents are, are occurring, they're not on the Salestine Highway, they're not on Knott Street, Ridge Road, Jordan. They're just like this one on Yale and deeper in the communities. Yes. Are you seeing a decrease because of the PSAs that are going out there, because of the comments that people are making? <clears throat> Are you, you know, I hope so. I mean, that's why we do it. We try to notify the citizens. We use the Facebook page and um, media itself. We've actually had a couple of interviews with the TV channels through the years expressing that. Please lock your cars. Don't leave your keys in the cars. Don't leave your fobs in the garage where they're close enough to the car where you can start it because that's what they're looking for. If you actually watch, and some of the people actually have, you know, like the, the ring or some of these cameras that have night vision, you can see the kids, what they're doing as they go up to the cars. They're checking the doors to see if they're unlocked. If they're unlocked, they're going to push the button to see if they can start the car. Or if the keys are in the ignition, they'll, they'll take it that way. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the, I should have explained also when Councilor Hurley asked me that question. After the boy was robbed at the bus stop, we did flood the streets as much as possible in the morning, and I think a lot of the citizens saw that the officers were out there. Now, I had to bring them in on overtime. I had to um, take people that were inside and put them out there at that time. It's not something that we can maintain for a long period of time, but it was something that was important, especially after two days later, Windsor had the exact same crime. So no one's immune from this, and it could happen again, and if it seems to be escalating, I wanted Weathersfield citizens to be as protected as possible, to be as safe as possible. Like I said, we can't cover every street, but we did cover a lot. When the officers were out there, they were actually directed, if they saw somebody warming up their car, not with a car starter, but warming up their car with the keys and the ignition, to, to stop and talk to them and advise them that that could be a dangerous thing to do. Um, <clears throat> I know it's what you call it is victim blaming. We're not trying to vi blame the victims, we're really not. We're just trying to get people, one, to lock their cars, and two, not leave the keys or their fobs in the cars or near the cars. Um, <clears throat> but I think what's happened is because of those, the people are understanding that more. Although I did get a comment from a woman not too long ago. Um, what was it? She said uh, two of her cars were taken out of her driveway, and she said, why aren't you telling anybody this? And it was like banging my head against my desk because I, we, it's all we've been doing for the last two years is telling people about this, is to lock mm -hmm. your cars and don't leave your fobs and your keys in the car. But um, she didn't think that we had been notifying them enough. And I, I'm not trying to blame victims, but one of the, the officers were directed if they saw that in a driveway or a car running to go up to the homeowner and explain to them that that's, that's not a good thing to do. <clears throat> as politely as possible. Some people accepted the advice very nicely. Some people get off my property. That's my car, I can do what I want with it. I remember one guy, I stop at the corner store, Church and Silas, 
on a regular basis to buy lottery tickets. And um, <laughs> I, sh I saw a guy with his car running out there. And I said, you know, your car's running out there. And he, his response to me was, yeah, I know. I can see it. Well, you think that you're going to be able to stop it if somebody jumps in it and drives off? His response to me was, yes, I could stop it. And so some people just aren't rational. Chief, you bring up a good point. Location-wise, yeah. are we talking Rocky Hill border, Newington, Salstein, not Street Jordan? Or is in it regards much? to the car breaks? Yeah. No, they are all over. Rocky Hill is getting hit just as hard as we no, are. No, but in, within, within, within confines of Weathersfield. No, they're all over. They truly are. Um, a, the last one we had last night was Haystack. Uh, you can't get more in the middle of Weathersfield yeah. than Haystack. And that one is, I mean, a very unique scenario there because of the fact that what they did was there was two cars in the driveway, one in front of the other. Um, the car in front was the the boyfriend's car. The car in, in the back was the girlfriend's car. He comes out at 1.30 to go to work, gets into his girlfriend's car because he can't get his car out, so he thought, and drove off. His car wasn't even there. It was gone. We recovered the car, or I should say Hartford recovered the car um, later that day, and the keys were in it. They never left the keys in the car. What happened was they got into the car was unlocked. They got into the car to use the, the remote control in the garage, opened the garage, went into the house, got the keys off the kitchen table, took the keys, came back out, got into the car, closed the garage door, by the way, got in the car and jockeyed it out because we found the, the tire tracks on the grass. That must have taken them 20, 30 minutes to do. Nobody heard a thing. Nobody saw a thing. What do they do with the car, though? I mean, it's joyriding. You go into a house, you got DVD players, you know, MacBooks. That's just Chromebook. what I was talking about, the Chromebook. They didn't even take the Chromebook. That wasn't their target. I, I can't explain the mind of a 15, 16, or 17-year-old and why they do the things they do. It makes no sense to me. Why are they so interested in the phones? Most of the phones are locked. You know, I mean, most people have password codes we can't break apple cap password codes even for police work i i don't understand it it makes no sense to me one of the things that never made any sense to me either was just what i was talking about why are there carjackings why are people willing to commit robbery which is a far more serious crime than a car theft when all you got to do is stand in front of a, a convenience store and you can have your choice of cars left and right <laughs> it makes no sense to me but they do it i don't know if it's for the thrill or if it's just something to do because they don't have anything else to do but we don't definitely have a serious problem and what um the senator was saying he's the one that saved us from that raised the bill because that was a 900 page uh implementer bill that was one paragraph that had to raise the age to 21 not only raised the age to 21 as a juvenile but then a youthful offender would be uh, raised to the age of 25. Now, I don't know about most of the people here, and I think Eric can agree with me that most of our crimes are being committed by the people between the ages of 15 and 25. That's our most vulnerable situation. And if you made those individuals juveniles or youthful offenders, we'd really be in a, in a lot of trouble. There's a big difference between how you could have to deal with a, a juvenile than there is when you have to deal with an adult, uh, including their rights, and what they say, they could give a complete confession to you. It means nothing in a court of law unless their parent or guardian is present. They can't waive their rights. An adult can. So, uh, yes, I'm hoping that somebody comes to their senses and changes things around. We need, we definitely don't need to raise the age any higher. I'd like to lower the age. And even when you think about it, the state of Connecticut had a situation where 16 and 17 year olds were considered youthful offenders. That means if they got arrested for a nonviolent crime, they, they would go to like juvenile court. They would go and be treated like a juvenile. So 16 and 17 year olds were pretty much being treated as juveniles unless they kept committing crimes, unless they were repeat offenders. And then they were treated like an adult and they could end up going to jail. 
nobody wants to put a 16 and 17 year old kid in jail, but it's not on the first, second, third, or even ninth offense. It's usually much higher than that when they finally did go to jail. Well, that changed four or five years ago. Now there are, they are juveniles. 16 and 17 year olds are juveniles. Well, I know <clears throat> the governor has actually made statements to the fact that juvenile crime is down because there's uh, less arrests. But juvenile crime isn't down. There are less arrests, but it, the crime itself isn't down. Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. Chief, thank you for coming tonight in your presentation and for all that you and your officers do. I just want to explore a few areas uh, quickly with you. One you already touched on, I want to go a little deeper in two, two different ones. The one you already touched on are the uh, current uh, patrols of the schools. So as awful as the break-ins are, and we've been hearing a lot over about them the last couple of years, even worse in my mind and hearing more stuff is what happened to the 13-year-old and parents and the safety of them sending their kids to the bus stops and all that, hearing a lot about that, and that's truly scary. So you had mentioned that you've increased patrols in the short term, but it would be hard to do that over a longer period of time. Can you talk a little bit more about your plans in the short term? And then one of my follow-up questions to that is the impact of potentially hiring more officers, particularly for, for those types of activities. So if you could comment on that. Yes, we need more officers. I'm not going to deny that. I could use more officers on each of the shifts. Each shift has its own unique problems and things that we need to deal with, including uh, quality of life issues. Um, yes, I, I did. I do have a lot more patrols out there right now, but it is costing us, you know, out of overtime because of the fact that I've got the entire day shift coming in an hour early to go out there an hour earlier to cover the bus stops. We have 40 bus stops. We have, um, and they range in time from, I think the first one is at 6.45 or something like that. And I mean, so they're different times at different places. And I've got a lot of officers out there patrolling them, but there's no way you're gonna maintain that. But I wanna protect the kids now. So I, we'll do this and we're gonna continue doing it until it gets cost prohibitive. Great. And you said most of these crimes are being committed by 15 to 25-year-olds. Most of our the, crimes, Are yes. the great majority of them from kids outside of Weathersfield? Yes. Okay. So um, what do you, I want to get your opinion on how you feel the impact of neighborhood crime watches. Do you feel they're effective? I've heard from some people in town that they're interested in maybe starting that. Do you find them effective? And Absolutely. You, you do. We can kick all the help we can possibly get. The more eyes that are out there, the better off we are. Um, it's always been that way. We've always looked for citizen participation. Uh, organized crime watch groups are great, but it's not easy to maintain or to, to actually attain that. That's why you don't see a lot of crime watch groups. There, there, there's actually a formula that you have to follow to become an official crime watch group. Uh, Neighborhood Crime Watch is one of the groups that do that. Um, you can look it up on the, uh, on the internet, just Google Neighborhood Watch, and they'll, they'll show, tell you what you need to do and how to do it. And usually what it is, is one of those aspects of that, to develop that group, is to have a, a meeting with a number of people that want to participate, and it has to be a certain number. Uh, they don't reach that number. It sounds, a lot of people get involved, want to get involved in the beginning, and then it kind of wanes. And if it's not directly affecting them, it kind of goes away. But believe me, I would, I take all the help that we can get. And should they work directly with your officers on setting Absolutely. that up? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, they could work with us, but it's something that they have to attain themselves to get that official neighborhood watch title. Got it. The last thing I have, and this is for you and the delegation if they want to comment, is how, can you comment on working together with all of the towns that surround us, both from police as well as legislative, and trying to combat these problems together i mean we share obviously we're concerned about what happens here in our town but working together because these you know the break-in was a west Hartford car yeah. kids are coming from other towns can you comment a little bit on that i'll be glad to, i'm we do we work with them all the time in fact windsor detectives and our detectives were working on the, the bus stop robberies as soon as windsor's occurred um hartford we're in hartford all the time because that's where a lot of the information that we need to solve the crimes comes from the cars are being recovered in hartford 
when a car that was involved in a crime in Wethersfield is recovered in Hartford, we bring it back to Wethersfield and we process the car. We solved a lot of crimes that way through DNA and fingerprints. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of regionalization in regards to cooperation between the police departments. It always has been and it always will be. It's the only way we can fight crime. Crime is not localized, it's regional. It comes and goes all over the place. I know I have talked to the gentleman behind me and they're very supportive. They've always been very good. In fact, I called up Russ one time and kind of yelled at him. <laughs> um, I was talking to the town manager for a minute. No, well, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad. But I did uh, push, and that was uh, on the the PSAP thing. But it, whatever, the, uh, yes. So there's a lot of cooperation. I'm not worried about. Don't forget, each police department has its own problems, and they have to address it their own way. But there is a lot of cooperation between the police departments, and we do get a lot of cooperation from the the, the representatives and the senators, especially Senator Doyle. And I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I'll just add. Thank you, Chief. I just think um, for the, the next legislature to do anything on this issue, it's really doing what the, the town of Wethersfield has educated your delegation. The other towns have to do similar things to bring awareness to the, uh, the state legislators across the state. But, I mean, this is not just a greater Hartford problem. It's a statewide problem, so all the towns are concerned about it. But just like you, you have to bring awareness to the delegation statewide so legislators have awareness So next year. In the session, they can all, pre, you know, if they're all, if all the all legislators are educated like you are, presenting the message to our delegation, you will get change at the Capitol. Just, you know, Councilman Lesser, uh, you talked about what we can do too. The chief, being the head of the Police Chiefs Association, he will be talking to obviously everyone throughout the whole state of Connecticut. So therefore, there could be some language they want to propose that they can give to the next legislative body in regards that probably will have to go through the Judicial Committee and so forth. But that is one way of trying to combat this in regards to what their insight is on this. So therefore, they can bring it to us and then move that ball forward. Thank you. Or not me, but the next representative. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, and, uh, Representative Lesser. That's a very good question. And, and that's what I, I tried to say a little bit at the beginning. I'd already spoken with Senator Fonfara, the majority leader who's from Hartford, uh, the speaker is from Berlin. He and I have had these discussions, and that's uh, paramount that we talk to people throughout the state and, and try to get some, some discussions because uh, one of the problems at this point is there's, it's not a problem, it's actually a good thing, but there's probably 30 new legislators out of 151 coming in, freshmen. Committees haven't been uh, established leadership of certain committees hasn't been established and and until that happens it's it's you know to to get specific things done is going to be a little difficult that being said the discussions are already ongoing and uh one thing about weathersfield folks is you're very vocal and we hear from you all the time which you should you should contact us and let us know what's going on and uh it, it helps us to to get that ball rolling but uh, like I said before, you have my commitment that I'll be working with with Kerry and, and my colleagues in Newington and Cromwell and Rocky Hill uh, to, dis to discuss these issues and try to come up with uh, solutions. Uh, and, and obviously we always work with the police to try to get uh, their input because oftentimes laws that we write, um, they, have, they have a lot of input telling us what works, what doesn't work. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Just oh, briefly, if okay. I could say, Mayor, sure. um, Chief, I'd, it'd be great if you could help us with the data in terms of um, the ages of those that you have either apprehended or have been involved in crime here in, in Wethersfield. Um, it's one thing to react here in this forum to what happened to this young man, this young boy, um, which no parent ever wants to experience no question about it. It's another thing to try to translate that into action at the legislature. We have to have the data. We have to have support that this policy, as well intended as it might be, if it's not working. And I appreciate what you said, Chief, about the youthful offender provision that no longer exists. That's exactly what I was trying to get at, that it's one thing to give opportunities like uh, someone with youthful indiscretion. It's another thing to say, three, four, five, ten times, you can do that with impunity. That should not stand. Thank you. 
Okay, are there any other questions? Deputy Mayor. Uh, Chief, this is for you and or in combination with the superintendent. I know after that young man uh, was accosted, uh, something went out to the parents telling them what they should do in the future. You know, kids as buddies, maybe one parent being there, whatever. For the benefit of the residents out there who don't have kids in the school systems, can you tell us what you've recommended to parents so that everybody knows what you're trying to do to alleviate this from happening in the future? Uh, I'm not sure what was put out. Good evening, Mr. Emmett. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. My pleasure. Nice to be here with you. Yeah, we uh, set out a couple of communications uh, since this happened last Monday. Certainly, uh, we were disturbed by it, a despicable act, to say the least. Um, on Friday evening, I sent out a communication through our school messenger system to um, all of our community members uh, in the school system. We talked about uh, being vigilant and maintaining awareness. Um, several of the things we talked about were to make sure you had a plan, an escape plan, uh, knowing where you would run to. If parents were going to work early, have a neighbor or a relative, have eyes on students. We talked about not having earbuds on and not having noses down in phones. That is a major, major problem. We all do it. And it decreases the level of awareness of environment. We also talked about uh, the process of going to uh, bus stops in groups. Um, most of our stops, with the exception of kindergarten, our stops are cluster stops, so there are more than one student there. But in the case of our student last week, he was the only one there. And that could be a variety of different situations where he got there early and was the only one there, the other students were sick or got a ride to school. Um, from a school district perspective, one of the things we did, um, we alerted all of our bus drivers through autumn transportation uh, to be on the alert. Um, if you see something, say something. So our bus drivers were um, told to radio in to dispatch immediately if they saw anything suspicious. If any students got on a bus and reported anything, it was to be reported to dispatch so that the police could be contacted as well. Um, we have our uh, director of security, Hal Even, uh, was instrumental in helping to uh, get the um, document out on Friday. In addition to that, we have our residency officer, Michael Goddard, retired uh, Weathersfield police officer, um, who works with us part time. Uh, after this incident occurred last Monday, uh, instead of his surveillance being focused in one area, he too uh, monitored neighborhoods. Uh, he has a police radio, so he was able to radio in any suspicious activity. Um, one of the things he spoke to was he was struck by the number of cars he saw uh, completely unattended warming up in driveways. So to the point that Chief made, it's, it's happening. Um, we're going to continue to be diligent. It is holiday season, so, you know, the other piece, how many of you are getting uh, packages delivered to your homes? So it's definitely going to be, it's, it's crime season, so we certainly want folks to be aware, uh, be alert, and uh, let's make sure we have eyes on kids. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilor Forrest, did you have a question? Thanks, Mayor. Um, I think uh, it's probably mostly for the chief, but just in general, I, I think it's across the dais and probably even at the legislature, generally speaking, and where we talk, it's where we are now is not acceptable. And this is not, this is, I, it, from what I'm hearing, it's the escalation of other crime. And, and people on this dais were talking to our residents when we were talking about being elected about that there's crime this crime uptick has been going on for a couple of years now, or years, mm -hmm. and we're at the point now where I think we're looking for a plan, and we've recognized that we have an issue, and if we're sort of going to take it seriously, what is our plan? If, if this is happening throughout the state and it's known, and you're talking, you're the, chief, the police chief's president, and you're talking to the police chiefs, are the police chiefs have a plan to start to change this, to keep us safe, to make recommendations? Where are they? Are they being expressed to us? Can we support you in those things? If this is a recognized thing that's going on for 24 or 36 months, what's the plan? All right. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. There is no distinct plan. Each individual community is trying to deal with the problems that they have in their communities themselves, in a sense. There's, uh, there's how, how, what you're, you're getting back how do I say this? Um, the governor's office says the crime rate is going down. What I'm telling you is what I see is the crime rate is going up. I can feel it. I know it. I see the reports that are coming across my desk. I see the reports that, that um, and it's an escalation of the type of crime. But when you have 
a government that's not recognizing it and actually saying that the crime rate is going down, that less people are being arrested, that's why they're closing the jails, and that's why there's more people on the street that maybe deserve to be in jail. When you take narcotics, for example, and make possession of narcotics a misdemeanor, now those people that get arrested in those situations, and I'm not talking the first offense or second offense, um, what do you think is going to happen? It, it just keeps going. You're enabling those individuals, and the people that are using narcotics are the people who are committing the crimes. So maybe if they went to, in the old days, if they went to jail for possession of narcotics, which was a felony, then they weren't out there committing the burglaries and the shopliftings to support their habits. But there's a, two schools of thought on that. You know, is it fair to, for someone who has an addiction to go to jail? Well, as a citizen, yeah, because I don't want to be robbed by that individual. But I, I, I don't want to get into the politics of things. I don't want to make it sound like uh, I'm casting aspersions on the state government, <coughs> not these guys. But there's a problem. There is a problem in the state, and I don't see it getting better. Not in the near future, anyways. Uh, the legislature, they've always been receptive. I've gotten calls from, from all of these gentlemen asking me questions, which I really appreciate, about what we're doing and trying to get the reality of things before they go and vote. And I know it's tough. Actually, Senator Doyle put me on a task force one time for liquor. liquor. Man, I'm telling you, I don't know how they do it because I'm listening to one side, it sounds perfectly reasonable, and then to get 180 degrees on the other side, that sounded reasonable to me too. How do you make a decision? Well, the best way to make the decisions is with the most information that you can get. That's good information, real information, not fluff. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that there, Senator Doyle. <laughs> So, I was an education so, in, in that part. So it seems, but it seems like you you have a an un clear understanding about what's going on. You talk yes. to your colleagues, whether it's West Hartford, and some right. of the facts you gave us, they they've got to be handling the same stuff. Like yes. the West Hartford Town Council and the Rock Hill Town Council right. has to be hearing from their individuals too. They're, you're hearing from us. I I can't think that the legislature, not just in Central Connecticut, because we've heard the same things in Ridgefield and the whole going yes. on, that they're not hearing the same types of things from from their group. So why, or maybe I shouldn't say, but, but take back seriously, whether it's the legislative here, I know we have one right here as well, but let's, let's put together that task force to figure out what's going on, to see if the pendulum has strung, swung in one direction too far. Let's put together the task force, not just with the police chiefs, but with the legislatures, but the state's attorney's got to be in this as, as well, I would think. And with the local town governments, because if it's, if it's also the mayor of Rocky Hill and Newington and Cromwell and Middletown and so on and so forth that has to understand this concept to be able to talk to their legislative delegations to get it done, I think that that is the type of action that at least this seat is, but I'm going to guess a lot of the public is looking for, is what is the reaction instead of there's, just saying it's just not working. There's nothing more it's powerful. Not it's not working. It's nothing more powerful than a grassroots uh, you know, coming from the bottom up. That's very powerful. But the problem is, is that sometimes it doesn't rise to that level. It doesn't, you don't have enough voice. And there's other voices that are trying to drown you out that, that have a different agenda. Um, one of the things that I, we put up on our Facebook page was the, the, the op-ed that was written by the chief state's attorney, Kevin Kane, talking about juvenile problems. And that was... I think it was at least, it's probably close to a year old anyways. Uh, it's the same thing. It hasn't changed. I agree with what you're saying, and I'll take all the help I can get, and I'll take all the ideas that you can give me, too, to try to combat this. But I don't know of anything specifically to try to, I mean, I can ask for more officers. That, that will help. But is it going to be the cure-all? No. I can ask for more overtime. Is that going to help? Yes. But it's not going to be the cure-all. And I'm not an expert as much as you are or some of the people that sit in the Judiciary Committee at the legislature and so on. But I'm asking you, with the, with the leadership at the state letter, the leadership at your level, with the leadership at this level, to be able to start to come up with some actionable steps, whether it's, whether it's a roundtable between the in, interested parties, including the, including the kids, including the kids, to be able to solve this problem. 
and to be able to come up with some actionable steps so that we can be part of the solve rather than just, ju not just, but also sharing our, our frustrations. Next time we arrest a 16-year-old for committing a, a serious crime, I'm going to invite you down to the station to talk to that young man. I'd like to see that. I'm not sure that I have all the answers either. No, I'm but you at least get a feel for what you're dealing with when, in, with some of these individuals. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Sorry. I just want to add something. I just want to add some historical context. Four years ago, when the, rate, the, the age was raised 16 and 17, for the record, all, the Police Chiefs Association, a predecessor, was Chief Salvatore as president. He and the entire association opposed this legislation. All the state's attorney, including Kevin Kane, opposed this legislation. So there was opposition four years ago. It's a trend nationwide, and there was a strong input at the Capitol. Very um, powerful individuals at the Capitol supported it, including the governor. So there was strong impetus, and um, it's not going to be, it's going to, I agree, it's going to take a grassroots effort to raise the consciousness of legislators. Because, um, no, I'm not saying all of it's bad, but there are certainly, it should be revisited and it can be changed, I think. And, um, but I'm, listen, I was kind of a fringe person who didn't support it. Most people supported it, but I think now we're seeing the repercussions. And I think it's an opportunity for you, Counselor, to come to the Capitol and testify when that bill has a public hearing. I mean, people need to hear from the citizens, from councilmen, bring the perspective of the Capitol, because right now, maybe more this year, but prior, from, year, from last year and past, it was a wilderness. No one opposed it. So now maybe it will be a consciousness. There's an opportunity for our mayor to come and testify at the Capitol on legislation. That would be helpful to bring the consciousness to the legislators, the Judiciary Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all of you coming tonight, taking your time out of your busy schedule. Um, we are going to ask the police chief if he can remain for public comment, um, but we have a representative from the MDC who has to be in Rocky Hill shortly to get to the end of their council meeting, so we're going to have to move bump now uh, to the MDC's brief presentation on their budget before we get into public comment. So I understand if the, uh, our delegation's not able to stay, but we have asked the police chief to stay so that he can hear public comment, and then we can bring those remarks back to our legislators as well. Yes, may I have a motion to um, go out of order on the agenda? May our motion to go out of routine on the agenda and move up MDC's presentation? Second. Ahead of public comments? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Welcome. Sorry about the delay tonight. That's okay. Thank you. And I appreciate you fitting us in before the budget vote this year. No problem. Good evening, um, Madam Mayor and uh, Deputy Mayor and members of the Council. John Zinsraw from the Metro Island District. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. And we have uh, three of our MDC commissioners here are in attendance as well. Um, I'm going to walk briefly through a presentation. This presentation is a shortened version of um, a longer presentation as we're going to give probably on Monday evening, December 10th, to the full board when they consider the 2019 proposed budget. That all these slides here are an excerpt of that presentation, which is up on the MDC website. In addition, the proposed budget books 
uh, for the CIP as well as the operating expenses are up on the MDC website as well as all the resolutions. Uh, what you see here is our meeting schedule and basically what we have accomplished so far um, last, fr last Wednesday evening, November 28th, we had the Board of Finance meeting as well as the Water Bureau public hearing and the Water Bureau meeting. Uh, the MDC Board of Finance did make some modifications to the proposed budget that was originally discussed with the member towns, and we're going to go through those changes, and those are reflected in this presentation. We're at the point on the next step in the process is next Monday evening, the MDC government will have a hearing, a public hearing at 4.45 p.m. at the uh, district's offices at 555 Main Street, followed by the government meeting where they're going to uh, vote on the proposed uh, ordinances, the sewer ordinances, and then followed thereafter by the district board meeting where the full board will uh, react or uh, ask questions and uh, consider the 2019 proposed budget that was referred over last Wednesday evening to them by the Board of Finance. Just want to go through some of the big items that are in the, that are driving the 2019 proposed budget. The MDC uh, collective bargaining unit agreements uh, are expiring at the end of December 31st, 2018. So our strategy was to get out in front of them as well as, uh, you know, as, uh, have them set. So we're proud to report that we have a new four-year collective bargaining unit agreement that will be a contract through December 31st, 2022. And we, had, in this negotiation, we, t we tackled some of the long-term liability concerns uh, such as uh, pension, OPEB, and by doing so, what we have done is we've increased the pension contribution for all collective bargaining unit folks uh, from 5% to 7.5%. We've eliminated spousal and, uh, and dependent medical dental coverage upon retirement for all, employ all collective bargaining unit employees hired after June 5th of 2018. For those employee group, we have also terminated the Medicare B premium reimbursement for those employees. And no, all new employees will be enrolled in a health savings account with a high deductible health plan starting with a 16% premium share, which will escalate uh, to a cap of 18% in the year 2021 and 22. Um, in addition, the collective bargaining folks are going to be making an OPEB contribution of 1% for all new employees and then all collective bargaining employees after December 31st, 2018. As we do, uh, it, it, our tendency is we, we lead with the modifications to the exempt and excluded benefits. Um, as of March 1st of 2018, all exempt and excluded employees that are hired after that date are at the 7.5% pension contribution. They have no spouse or dependent medical dental coverage upon retirement, elimination of Medicare B, so we've brought the union up in line with the exempt employees now. As you can see on the third bullet line, in order to bargain some of these long-term benefits away, we had to, had to have slightly higher COLA, so it's a 3% COLA for 19, 20, and 21, and reducing to 2.5% in 2022. When you actually look at the, the impact on the long-term liabilities, it's next generation. The OPEB um, liability to be created by the next generation workforce will be cut in half by about $40 million over the long term. Another main driver in the 2019 proposed budget is the MDC, as you can look in the MDC's December 31st, 2017 CAFR. Uh, we have an unfunded OPEB liability, which is using a discount rate because we have no assets of around 3.5%, and that's about in excess of $300 million. So one of the requests from the MDC commissioners was for us to uh, come up with an OPEB funding plan over a 10-year period to walk into the actually develop, determined contribution. Um, we had our uh, actuary Milliman go and do that, the analysis, um, taking advantage of a higher discount rate up to six and a quarter because we're making consistent contributions in excess of the actual medical expenses going out for the retirees. Uh, 2019's contribution is $9.146 million, and in 10 years that will step us up to the actu actually determined contribution by 2028 and give us about, a, about an 18% funding level at that point in time. Just to put it in perspective, the $9.146 million as a contribution from the operating budgets and the capital uh, budget into the uh, OPEB trust fund, the outflows of expenses for retiree medical in 2017 were $6.6 .6 million. As you'll see in a few slides later, we had been funding the OPEB at about a $5 million level, so we were creating a deficit in the OPEB trust fund. In addition, medical benefits for the active employees 
485 employees that we have current active are actively employed. Um, the medical contributions over the last several years have been have been trimmed into the internal service fund uh, for budgetary reasons, and the internal service fund is generating a deficit at the same time. At the end of 2017, in the CAFR, the, you'll notice a deficit balance in the internal service fund of about $8.2 million. The majority of that is the incurred but not reported liability of 5.2, but there's a $3 million cash deficit as of 17. And as you'll see, that, the, that deficit's going to grow through 2018. So the medical benefits for contribution to the internal service fund for the active employees is in this proposed budget of $15.3 million between operations and CapEx. In addition, in, to, in August of 2018, the NBC did a general obligation bond issue in the amount of, we had $120 million original par to take out our, expi our, our maturing bands that are supporting the uh, water, CIP, the non-clean water project sewer programs, as well as the combined capital programs. That was issued and successfully issued, generated a significant amount of premium. The premium was utilized to pay off the interest on the short-term borrowings. As, and we were able to downsize the premium, the par down to uh, 110.77 million, but the uh, and the tick was 3.31 percent. Um, the debt service on that issuance is 10.5 million, uh, about six million of it hitting the general fund, which is primarily ad valorem, and the balance of four and a half million is on the water, which is borne by the water rate. In addition, in 2019, we're anticipating debt service associated with drinking water fund and clean water fund interim funding obligations and project, uh, project loan obligations. These are from the, the state of Connecticut's uh, state revolving fund. There's usually grants and loans, uh, grants associated with these loans. But we're converting IFOs to PLOs, which is going from short-term financing to long-term permanent financing. That will put another $2 million increment of debt service on those two. In addition, in the general insurance category, as you're well aware of, the Clean Water Project has been underway since 2007. Uh, part of the milestones uh, in the consent order and consent decree is to have the um, wet weather expansion as well as the uh, Headworks projects down at the South Meadows in Hartford as well as in Rocky Hill for them to come online. So as those are coming along as a, online as 1231.18, those asset values in excess of a half a billion dollars are being now transferred off our builder's risk policies, which have been funded by the Clean Water Project surcharge, onto our property casualty. So that's driving an insurance uh, premium increase around $75,000. And as well as in the internal service fund, um, we have, we're going to have to increase the self-insured retention and claims contribution by about $475,000. Um, due to um, expenses incurred by the districts for sewer and water backups. Um, of note, everybody's probably read in the paper about Lynbrook in uh, West Hartford. Those are the kind of in instances that go into the self-insured retention fund. In addition, in our water portion of our budget contained within the special agreements and programs for water, um, riverfront recapture is being consistent originally in the the budget that was was proposed, it was being reduced to 600000 but uh, by um, action of the Board of Finance, it was put back up to its 2018 adopted budget funding level of $1.25 million. That is purely in the water side and on the water rates. So that's uh, passed through on the water bills. And in addition, the Operation Fuel Program, we ran a pilot for um, needy customers for $50,000 in 2018. We're once again funding that in the 2019 proposed budget in the same amount. When you, when you take into, into account what I've just spoke of, when you look at our 2019 proposed operating expenditures, this schedule here, I've broken them down in the, as a percentage of the total budget, and you will see that our payroll and payroll related expenses are 38% of our budget. So when you look at that dollar amount, it's increasing uh, $10.65 million. In there is your, is your wages, it's your employee benefits, your pension contributions, and your OPEBs, which I have a slide I'll walk you through later. Um, the debt portion of our budget is 34.5% of our total budget. And as I just mentioned, we did the GEO bond, and you can see that's increasing $9 million. That's driven by the issuance of the August GEO bond, as well as the conversion of the IFOs and PO to PLOs for the clean water and drinking water funds. <clears throat> General operations 
increasing 381,000. That's about 8.5% of our total budget. Uh, in January of 2018, we had an inordinate, had the highest amount of breaks in the water mains uh, on history with the NBC. That resulted in an unfavorable overtime variance is in excess of 500,000, as well as the ancillary uh, materials from stock to look to, to fill and the aggregate to put the pipe back into the ground, and that's generating an increase there as well. The contingency line going up to from 2 million 550 in 2018 to 4 million in 2019, that's not a contingency for expenses. That's an offset to the, the revenue, as you may have been aware of or you've heard at the Connecticut uh, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. They took over the Hartford landfill. The Hartford landfill is discharging groundwater through a deep permit into the NBC sewer. We have a, a rate for that because that uh, there's all kinds of um, different elements in that water that need to be treated that is corrosive. We charge 13 cents per gallon to treat that. Um, in the 2018 adopted budget, uh, there was $2.55 million in revenue that was supposed to be invoiced and was invoiced to the Connecticut Deep. They are not paying it. So this contingency is a reserve against the revenue. And based upon the actual flows in 2018, we were able to get the actual flows. It's about $4 million a year. So this is just offsetting to zero out the revenue. There is discussions between the district and the, and the Connecticut Deep as well as OPM to come to a resolution. We have not received one at this point yet. Um, As I mentioned before, payroll, uh, on the payroll and related expenses, this is a, a rather significant increase, as I said before. On the regular pay line, it's an increase of $2.2 .2 million. How's that breaking broken up, as we discussed earlier, with the collective bargaining unit contracts, uh, the 3% COLA from 2009, for 2019 to achieve the, the long-term savings and the pension and OPEB benefits, that's contributing about a $1.1 million of that $2.2 .2 million increase. The uh, collective bargaining unit steps is another 300,000. Um, and there's a transfer, as you can see in this sh the table on the bottom, we're transferring some CIP, five CIP headcount upwards into the operating budget. Um, you may be aware that over the course of the past seven to 10 years, the district has been doing a capital program to replace water meters, install um, RF units. Um, we have gone through the full cycle, so now we will have 98% on the ITRON RF meters uh, and, and reading program. So therefore, it's no longer going to be a capital project. We're bringing those folks back into our maintenance budget. So that transfer is contributing about $400,000 of that $2.2 .2 million increase. And we have a few new positions that are contributing another $300,000. <clears> the overtime increase of $184,000, we've kept our overtime hours basically flat. 110,000 of the 184 is the impact of the COLA. The employee benefits increased the $5.4 million. As I was talking just a few minutes ago about the, the medical contributions, in the middle of the page here, you'll see the medical contribution line. And the way this works is <clears throat> we have the two budgets. We have the OPEX uh, headcount, which is in water and sewer. That is a budgetary contribution into the internal service fund. The actual claims get paid out of the internal service fund. And there's uh, the, the CIP headcount also contributed into the internal service fund. In perspective, in 2017, we contributed $8.1 million into the internal service fund between the OPEX and CIP headcount. We had $13.5 million in actual medical claims. <clears throat> in 2018, we contributed $9 million, our estimated actual is 14.3 million. So obviously, um, in 2000, in the 2018 at $9 million, we need to take a corrective action. So that's what's driving the $15.3 million of medical claims uh, contribution in the two budgets. We're taking our 2018 estimated actual and we're inflating it by medical inflation at 7% to get to the 15.3 million. At the same time, as on the first part, the OPEB contribution, I talked about the 10-year step into the actually determined contribution. That's 9,145. <clears throat> that's being budgeted, and that's the split between the operating piece and the and the capital piece. Pension contribution, 5,688. That's a reduction from the prior year. 
what we do with the, the pension assumptions, we look at the eight member towns and we try to be within the, the realm of the, ex, the uh, member towns assumptions with regards to amortization of the prior service costs. We're at 21 years, as well as the discount rate, we're at seven and a quarter percent, which is consistent right in the middle of all the eight member towns. <coughs> as I mentioned before, here is the debt service line. Basically, the main driver is the August 2018 general obligation bond. <clears throat> the interest just from that issue was $4.5 million. As you can see, the interest on bonds is going from $18.9 million up to $22.9 million. So that's basically a $4 million increase. The offset reduction, obviously, is you know as we're paying down some older debt. In the same way, you see on the principal on bonds, $34.9 million up to $41.9. That's an increase of seven. Basically, it's the six million from the general obligation issue plus the portions from the drinking water and clean water fund IFOs. So those are the, the expense drivers. So on the other side of the equation is the revenue. <coughs> As you can see here, those the water utility budget is here for the revenues on the top and the expenses on the bottom at 98.2 million. They balance, we don't make profit. We we establish revenues to equal the expected expenditures. Flipping over to the next page, <clears throat> primarily the operating revenues are 95 million, 95.9 million, and there's three categories. The top piece there, the service charges. This is your fixed monthly charges, 24.7 million. <clears throat> That's your your customer service charge for a traditional uh, five eight inch meter household, 14 1498. That's remaining flat with 2018. It also includes approximately $1.7 million of the non-member town surcharge revenue. That's also flat with last year. And this category also includes the special capital charges for the non-member town if we non-member towns. If we do capital projects just to benefit <coughs> members in the town of Farmington, Glastonbury, South Windsor, and East Granby, they bear the entire amount of those capital improvements. It's not included in the base water rate. On the bottom section, on the other operating revenues, two of the large increases on fire protection services is due to our rate structure. Um, some certain <coughs> commercial entities have what do we call a dual purpose meter. They have one meter for their water service as well as the same meter for the fire protection. So what we're now doing is having a fire protection is, is, a, is a uniqueness to that customer, so we're charging them for them. If you had a customer that had two feeds, one for fire service and one for <coughs> their service they'd have they'd pay the rate so we always modified the the rate structure to capture the fire protection cost associated with dual meters and then down on the bottom and the other water revenues <coughs> the increase of nine hundred thousand dollars that's uh, related to uh, cross connection testing uh, what is cross uh, cross connection testing if you have an irrigation system you have you have a backflow valve so that if there's anything that happens it doesn't feed back into our system thank you um, and we're establishing that at ninety dollars a test so those are <laughs> so an angle there that wouldn't be good <laughs> <laughs> so uh, those are the the main drivers and if you look at in the water use the sixty four point four million dollars what that is that's <clears throat> budgeted consumption expectations of 18.4 million CCFs. A CCF is 748 gallons, times our proposed water base water rate of three dollars and fifty cents. Um, our consumption for 2019 is flat with 2018. The 2018's budget was calling for 18.4. <clears throat> Where we expect to come out for 18 is about 18.2 million. We're a little bit short of consumption. As you can all appreciate, the month of August, I think we set a record with the amount of rainfall, and I think we just did it for November as well. So when it rains, people don't use the water to irrigate, and they don't, they don't go out, so we, we sell less water. What does this all mean to the individual household? <clears throat> On this slide here, we've chosen 100 CCFs. It's kind of a, you know, it varies by what you have. My household, I live in West Hartford in member town. I use more than 100 CCFs a year. But here, this is kind of a typical standard that, that's used in uh, engineering firms and so forth. So as you can see, <clears throat> the 2018 rate structure is $3.14. That's going up to $3.50. So it's about an 11.46% change on the volumetric water. Um, clean water project charge, the next line is proposed 
to go from $3.80 to $4.10. That's <coughs> the $2.5 billion multi-year project, which is uh, based upon the 2015 long-term control plan, <coughs> is to be completed around 2029 or so. You may recall a couple weeks ago, uh, Joe, Liber La Joe LaLiberti and I was here, that he made a presentation with regards to the integrated plan. The integrated plan is going to be the 2018 submission for modification. So we're hoping that we'll be able to do, have the support and implement the integrated plan through the, the approved long-term control plan, and that will, as I'll show you a little bit later, take a little pressure off the Avalorum. One here also, the water customer service charge I mentioned is staying flat, <clears throat> and the sewer customer service charge, which was introduced in 2018 at $3 per month, is going up to $6. So all in all, for a member town customer, um, about a $102 increase per year, so that's about $8 and I think 50 cents per month. On a non-member town below, as you can see, they don't pay the clean water project because the clean water project is only for MDC customers that have both MDC sewer and water. Um, otherwise, you can see they're paying the same general, they're paying the same customer service charge. <coughs> the G GS is the general surcharge out, outside the district. Their increase per year is about $36, about $3 a month. What this does not show, it doesn't show the special capital charges because there's a unique charge for Glastonbury, South Windsor, and Farmington. <coughs> On this chart here, <coughs> based on 100 CCFs, this, is, this does not include the special sewer service charge. This is just looking at the base water service. If you're using 100 CCFs, per the previous slide, it will cost you about $530 a year for water service. That's up from the 494 from our 2018 adopted rates. And I'm showing the comparison of some of the, the larger water companies in the state of Connecticut. Aquarian Northern Division, that's Granby and Simsbury portions. Connecticut Water and Unionville Division, that's actually MDC Water. Um, we sell that to them. <clears throat> Aquarian Water Eastern Division, that's their largest amount of customers. They're at $578 per year. South Central Regional Water Authority is very an agency similar to us, $643 per year, and Connecticut Water, which is their uh, Connecticut Water Division, the largest division, is $818. So for the base water service, we're a cost-effective, high-quality deliverer. On the general fund, the sewer side of the business, um, of the concern of the, of the councils here, the top line, <clears throat> the Avalorum, the tax on the member towns, currently um, we have reduced that amount when we talked to the member towns, it was at 15% increase, it's now at 7%. How did we do that? Um, we, cut a, we cut some head count out, not a lot, but the material end of, you'll see, um, the last line of the revenue, surplus designated from prior year of $3.5 million. <clears throat> we talked about the groundwater, Remediation revenue from the state of Connecticut deep for the Hartford landfill that they're not paying, which is reserved. Um, we also uh, have found that there's other customers that have popped up that are using it. The state of Connecticut deep issues the permits, and then they don't tell us, but then the customers have to report through a DMR report on a monthly basis, which is a discharge monthly report. There's a sizable customer in East Hartford that started discharging. Um, was not in our forecast or was not in our adopted 2018 revenue stream. And we learned about it and it started invoicing July 1st. So the impact of that revenue from July 1st of 2018 through December is forecasted to be $3.5 million. So since it was <coughs> un unbudgeted, it would be increasing the general fund balance. And we're within our, um, let's call our rating metrics for fund balance as percentage of revenues based upon the rating categories that we desire. So we're going to pull that revenue, one-time revenue forward to offset the, the ad valorem for 2019. The other increase is revenue from other government agencies increase. That's due to increased sludge. We take sludge and septage down at the Hartford plant. We incinerate it. We generate electricity. We put about 40%, up to 40% of our footprint of our electricity on that facility by doing this. So it's a win-win, we get revenue for taking it, and we generate electricity so we don't have to pay Eversource. <clears throat> Other sewer revenues going up 2.9 million. That's a combination of the septage taking in, but there's also $1.9 million of revenue associated with that large customer that contributed $3.5 million in 2018. So the question whenever you show that revenue, have they, 
have they paid and you expect it, unlike Connecticut Deep? Yes, we invoiced $1.7, $1.8 million, and they paid that in, in um, October, so we're anticipating to be paid for all that. Um, the Avalorum, you can see the breakout. The Avalorum is allocated to the eight member towns based upon the formula in our charter, which is you take your prior three year cash receipts, you know, and you add their approximate to the entire eight member towns <coughs> and you determine the percentage. So, Weathersfield is at 8.26% uh, of the Avalorum for 2019, pretty consistent with 2018 and 18, 8.24. Um, the Weathersfield Avalorum is going up about $272,000 year on year. And one of the items I want to comment, someone, a, uh, it's a $271,600 increase, a 7.3% increase year on year. That's on the MDC's calendar basis. The MDC is on a fiscal calendar, January through December basis. You all are on a municipal calendar basis, a July 1 through June 30th. The Avalorum is collected through four payments, a January, April, July, and October payment. Our January and April payments do not exceed 50% of the prior year's Avalorum to account for the differences in municipal years because you're already in your fiscal 19 budget. So the most majority of the increase gets put into, or the, the increase gets put into the July and October payments, which will be in your fiscal 20 budget. So you'll see uh, on your member town basis, this is an increase of about 10% from your fiscal 18 to your fiscal 19, uh, because of the increase from last year was 8%. You're getting that increase in your July and October. <coughs> This slide here, and I'll make this comment, our, our independent consumer advocate always talks to me. This is just the base sewer cost for an average residential single owner occupied home in each of the eight member towns. And this is um, just basically taking a look at the, <clears throat> at the housing inventories that are provided by the American Community Survey from the census, um, extrapolating what the average market value is then applying the accessible 70 percent factor for all towns with the exception of Hartford. Hartford's at 32 percent. And then using your adopted mill rates, calculating what the average property tax is, as well as I'm applying our ad valorem on the municipal calendar basis relative to your adopted 19 budget times that percent. It works out that the base cost of sewer service in well, this field is $300 per annum. This does not include the special sewer service charge, which would be if it's for 2019 proposed, if you're using 100 CCFs at $4.10, that would be another $410 on top of this. A little bit different than the basis that Joe LaLiberti had presented with the integrated plan because they're doing it on a per household basis. A household also includes apartments. This is just single family residence. Clean Water Project, as we we're talking about it, the um, proposed rate for 2019 is $4.10. And just to put this in perspective, this project, there have been two referendums on this, one in 2006 for $800 million, a second one in 2012 for another $800 million, and $140, $140 million with supplemental uh, authorization. So the total capital authorizations through the end of December 31st, 17, was $1.74 billion. Over the course of time, starting January 1st, 2008, we've collected $330 million in clean water project uh, charge revenue. We've received a little over $256 million in grants from the state revolving fund, and we have outlaid $1.122 billion in capital to pay to contractors. And we have debt service that's totaling through the end of December 31st, 2017, $150.7 million. And you can see that through September 30th of 2018, I've issued $770.6 million of long-term debt associated with the Clean Water Project. This is all being paid for by the Special Sewer Service Charge. Um, primarily, I'm, say, I'm happy to say the majority of it is Clean Water uh, Fund, State Revolving Fund loans, which are 20-year loans at 2%, and they usually come with the grants that you saw above. But as you see in the 2018 forecast and 2019 forecast column, I have debt service that's increasing for $47.2 million for 18, up to $49.1 million in 2019. And the chart in the bottom is the curve of the special sewer service charge. Um, 
we're looking for a peak based upon the adopted long-term control plan of about $5.35. It's been going up smoothly and methodically um, to take any volatility out of, out of the payments. Um, as you can see, at the rate of $4.10, that will generate $66 million in revenue, and $49 million of it is going to be paid out for debt service, and then there's another $8 million that covers overhead. So we're spending 57 of the 66, and the remaining piece goes in the rate stabilization fund. Um, so as you see at the back end of the curve, where it just drops down dramatically, that's defeasing the debt when the <coughs> coverages have all been met on the revenue bonds. Um, I know that we have made the presentation on the integrated plan. What this chart basically shows is on the top is the forecasted uh, ad valorem increases. They're highlighted in the yellow boxes under the integrated plan on top and on the bottom status quo means that is the, there are certain projects that are currently being funded on ad valorem moved to the clean water project. And you can see if we stay the course and keeping them in the CIP for the sewer funded by ad valorem, Every two years, you, you get a, a mid-double-digit increase, and that's associated with the timing of issuance of geo bonds to pay for that debt, those capital projects. If we move it over into the clean water project, um, it, you know, the, it stabilizes the avalorum increases, and you'll see that in the periods of 2021 to 2023. Um, the clean water project, just as a reminder, that's a, a federally mandated uh, Department of Justice the consent order, consent decree. We, we're not doing it because we want to, we're doing it because we have to. And this is the funding to, in order to get that done. Um, then on the last slide, I have detailed the capital improvement plan for $73.1 million. This is just the, the water infrastructure at $29.9 million. These are the various projects that <clears throat> we need to approve in order to keep the water system at its, at its service levels. And the, the wastewater projects, there are sewer projects that are non-clean water project related. Um, the hope is that a good portion of this 23.9 million would go on to the integrated plan, if that's approved by the uh, Connecticut DEEP when we make our 2018 long-term control plan submission. And then the bottom piece is just our projects are mainly employees in here. This is when we talk about our capital that employees, our engineering service, construction services, survey construction and technical service those are our people that are working and managing the capital programs that we have and they're they're capitalized with the assets so i know that was a lot it was kind of a whirlwind but that's <laughs> kind of an update like i said is that you know we're this, this information's up on the website um i know we have the three commissioners that can help build some questions as well and thank you if i can just introduce our commissioners we have uh, Commissioner Camilleri, Adel, and Gardo here. <clears throat> um, and thank you for coming tonight and being here to listen to council and um, get our, our take on this budget. Um, do we have council members who have questions? Deputy Mayor? Yeah, I was, <clears throat> was lucky enough to come to your October 16th meeting. We made a similar presentation, mm -hmm. and I've seen some changes in here from them. Uh, the next day, uh, I believe your chairman your CEO and uh, we're meeting with uh, DEP regarding the, yep. uh, the charges that are due from the state. Uh, what was the result of that committee and is any of that money coming forward? There is no resolution to that issue at this point. It's still ongoing discussion. That's because of the additional amount due for the additional sludge coming out of uh, the Hartford landfill, which is well, saying they don't have the money to pay for? Yeah, they don't. The, the bill is up. They owe us, it's around $7 million now. All right, uh, and, and you did say that if that money does ever come across, that would go to reduce the ad valorem. In yes, the, future. The, the resolution that for the that was that went through, that was approved at Board of Finance says that in the event that this this the state of Connecticut deep does pay, it will be re, be returned back to the towns through an adjustment to the tax warrant. To put it in perspective, as you saw, the contingency is four million dollars in 2019's budget. <clears throat> we're expecting four million dollars of invoicing to the Connecticut deep. The Avalorum in 2018 was $45 million, so it's around a 9% of the, of the a 9 increase because of the non-payment. So we're currently at 7%. We were able to whittle off 2% if they had been stepping up and paying. 
at that same meeting, John, you were talking about reinstating some positions that you have left vacant in your budget to, you know, just keep things going, but you wanted to put them back in this year. Do those positions need to be filled this year, or could they be held off longer just to lower some of these things? Because you know, you, you've gone from 15% avalorum down to you know, seven and a half. You know, that's great. You cut it in half, but you know, Social Security is coming in at 2.8 this year, and it's going to be hard for yeah. our people to pay this. So, is there anything you can do to yeah. reduce any expenses further? From, what, from when we last talked in the presentations from September 17th and then October 16th, we reduced five headcount out of the operating budget just from the standpoint of vacancy. As I know, the consumer advocate, David Silverstone, had asked us to do that. <clears throat> if you see in the schedule on the bottom, our projected 2018 headcount in the operating budget is 399 folks. We're moving five people from CIP up in there, so we're, our, in essence, we're at, at 404, so we have, you know, we're going from 404 to 415. That's a, that's 11 heads, and, and unfortunately, a lot of them are in my department. That's why you see me here quite a bit. Yeah. So, as a result of that, if you know, OPEC is going up, then CIP should be going down in expenses because yes. of that. Yes, and that's more or less the, the decrease in the in the CIP is to the 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 conclusion of this of the CIP for the RF uh, meter replacement program. Uh, that ran its course. So those there were headcount that were budgeted in there. Those five headcount are being transitioned into a maintenance mode to address various other maintenance issues that we have. Are there other questions? <coughs> Councilor Hurley? Yeah. Could you go back to the increase in pay, the percent? Yes. The collective bargaining slide? Yeah. That one? It says 3% for the next three years. Um, none of the towns around or anybody gets 3% anymore, mm -hmm. even with givebacks in the union. So who negotiates your contracts? Our lawyers and um, obviously with input from uh, personal pension insurance. Uh, these are, I mean, from the changes, I mean, the, where we move from is the pension contributions were 5%. They're moved to 7.5. There was... Uh, there was no, there was spousal and dependent medical. I mean, what, you know, as I said before, is that's a $40 million savings over the course of the next generation of employees. And by doing this, this will cut the OPEB liability significantly. Um, the high deductible health plan, obviously you can see that the, the medical claims that, that we're putting in for our traditional PPO, that's where the majority of the people are. That's 15.3 million. We need to transition the folks to an HSA with a high deductible health plan, put some consumerism in them so that they will hopefully drive down the medical claims as well as in conjunction with wellness programs. Um, more than 45% of the MDC's active employees are in our 184 union. These are our guys out in the street, the blue collar union that are you know, out at 3 a.m. in the morning, knee deep in water in, in two degree weather, fixing water mains. It's a very, they're salt of the earth people and it's very difficult uh, job. So there's a lot of, you know, injuries associated with jobs. We have high workers' comps costs. Um, one of the questions I didn't receive here, but I received is why didn't you consider a defined contribution pension plan? Because, because of the work. Um, the studies have found out in, in extreme blue-collar environments such as this, um, you know, we, we need to get guys out at around 53 to 55 when they hit their rule of 85 because they have had subjected themselves to 30-something years of doing this labor, and they have higher incidences of workers' comp. And if we um, just allow them to self-select for their own in a, in a defined contribution plan, they don't have enough money to retire on. Where the DB plan, at the 2% for each year of service, they have something that, that plans for their retirement. So there was a lot of thought that went into the structure of, of the collective bargaining and agreements. And, one thing that's not on this slide is when I joined the district in 2007, we had in excess of 700 employees. We're down to 485. So there's a lot of reduction in human capital, which a lot of it was you know, investment in technology. The other things that were done in the prior collective bargaining sessions with multitasking job descriptions, you know, one classification, you don't need six people to show up to do a job, you can have two of them. So a lot of effort over the last eight years has been put in and thought on the collective bargaining process. Um, I mean, I, you, of course, in the 2019, uh, in the COLAs, there is, there is a, there's a premium for the givebacks. So, I mean, it, there is there's something in order to bargain to get it. 
Any other questions? Sure. Go ahead, continue. Um, in the regular pay, it's up 2.2 .2 million, 1.1 mm -hmm. 1 .1 cost of living, yep. 400,000 CIP movement, yep. Yep. and then 340,000 for um, increase in headcount. Yes. Because you, you had lower headcount last year than your budget, but you're still going up by four or five. Um, and then, but it's the first comment is increment 300,000. The steps. In the, in the contracts, the collective bargaining unit contracts, the, the job classifications of eight pay steps. So based upon satisfactory performance evaluation, they can get a step. Okay. Um, I don't have any other questions. I just think you should probably think about moving your pension, at least for newer employees that come on. Thank you. Councillor Rell? Well, I didn't have anything really to say, but I have to agree with Mike on that. Um, it's been year after year the MDC comes in here for um, a request to um, go up in their budget. This time, you know, the ad valorem alone at 7.3%. Mike touched on payroll increases, average homeowner going over $100 a year. Um, I think uh, at some point the, uh, the MDC, MDC should be looking more closely at, um, you know, reforming their, um, their pension plan, you know, uh, as Mike said, but also with the decrease in staff that you've said from, th you know, 700 down to 485, are we seeing, though, an uh, increase in the higher end salary? What uh, what you're what you're seeing is that there's there, there's there's over the tenure that I've been there, I've been here since April of 2007. There has been obviously there's been an investment in, infor in information technology. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of data that has to be processed. We're on SAP, so our IT resources were inadequate about five years ago. So there have been some increase in headcount, offset by some lower lower wage jobs that have gone. Um, you know, a lot of the headcount reduction from 700 down to this, there was the, the CRA contract. So you had a bunch of operators, probably 88 operators associated with that contract that have gone away as well. So there is some, as, as technology has changed, as well as the environment has changed, there has been some trade-offs to some of the replacement salaries had a higher salary point than some of the ones that went away. And I don't know if this slide was included up for the public, but we have it for the CIP. The increase in CIP over, I think, 2019-2020 was increased from 20, uh, yeah, 2019 to 2020, 29,900,000 to 39,500,000. Is that up there? No. You're talking this slide? Uh, it's actually one after that slide in our presentation. You got the multi year The, just to put it in perspective, so yeah, so in the multi-year capital plan for for water, you have 29.9 million in 2019. What's on here? 2020 is forecast at 39.5. Um, that that looked to me to be the the highest of the increase. The next one for wastewater was only four million, less than four million, and then the next one is you know, 1.1 million. Um, what are we going to see in the future for possible increases? It, going with the 3% for the next three years, 2.5% in the fourth year, mm -hmm. you know, those are obviously going to go up. But you, when we jump for our waste, uh, not wastewater, but for our water capital improvement by nearly $10 million, well, that's going to be a substantial. One, two things that I know that that's, that we have shared with uh, members of, of the, the town, member town. Currently, the, the model that we're following is $35 million a year for CapEx for, for sewer infrastructure, $25 million a year for water, and about 15 million for combined. Um, that's based upon an engineering analysis of the break-even point. If you don't spend the capital, you're going to increase on the maintenance side of it. You have to appreciate that a lot of the facilities, especially on the water, we have great water. We have an abundance of water through the drought in 2016. We never got below 75% of capacity. We had over a year 
and a half of supply. Um, the transmission line uh, from the reservoirs, we're talking 19 teens. You've got uh, West Hartford filters, the vintage of 1920. You also have, you know, aging water pipe in the ground. So there, you know, I guess, you know, part of the discussion we've had with the consumer advocate, and he said it on record, is that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we, and not much different than you look at our bridges and our roads around the state and around the country, not a lot of infrastructure investment. So these assets, you know, water pipe, sewer pipe, you know, as we saw the integrated plan, you see the, stat the condition of some of the, the sewers that are collapsing. These things have probably a useful life of about 100 to 120 years. The average age of some of these assets are, you know, overall is maybe 60 to 80 years, but we have some, you know, on the extremes. We have 1850 water pipes that are hollowed out tree logs. So there is, a, there is an asset management plan that's, that's forecasting capital to keep us. We've had some engineering <laughs> studies that say that 25 million a year for the water is not enough. Are any other municipalities seeing the work that we're seeing here in Southstein Highway, Mill Street, Middletown Avenue at all? I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with the project the, at all. I know a couple months ago we kind of had a yep. uh, discussion on that. Correct. Uh, are any other municipalities faced with that burden of, you know, construction going on for multi-year? There's construction going throughout all the eight-member towns. I mean, I'd say probably less in East Hartford, but there's emergency repairs. But I'd say that you'll, you'll see a fair amount of work, whether it be sewer or water. Um, there's water main projects going throughout the eight-member towns. There's water main projects that we need to do in the non-member towns as well. But that's born on the non-member town customers mm -hmm. solely. So mm -hmm. the, the need is, 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 uh, cross, is across the eight-member towns. Um, Things such as you're replacing or a redundant transmission line is is the feed from the, the reservoir into the treatment facilities. Um, there will be some analysis as to as consumption drops, you know, about what to do with the the two water treatment facilities. Do we need, you know, we're going to need to have some refurbishments of those as well. But that's going to benefit that benefits everybody. Mm -hmm. Had there ever been any discussions within the MDC about, you know? repaying some of the folks who've been negative, negatively impacted by any of that construction at all? I mean, any breaks to homeowners who've had to contend with trucks at, like you said, 7 o'clock in the morning, these workers coming out? I mean, it, you can make that case for almost any customer that's, in the MDC. Right. And then I, that's what you said, that every town is faced with it. I mean, is there any possibility of a, a give back or a, you know, Let's get a give a break to some of the, the rate payers. Well, for one of the things that we contend with is, is with the Niagara, we have to have a uniform rate structure. So it becomes difficult to treat customers differently. And in the event, if you could do that, if you're going to give this group, because I just said before that our, our, we're a nonprofit, revenue is equal expenditures. If you're giving a break to one customer group, another customer group is going to go up. Mm -hmm. And you know, from the standpoint on the sewer. You have a cost of service study, you know, which the, the consumer advocate was talking about, which is also up on the website that supports the sewer user charge because the, the question is, you know, ad valorem versus sewer user charge because the sewer user charge is your high flow industrial customers plus all your tax exempts. So you have to basically have a model that shows the balance, which we've always had, and we proved it out by doing it in the methodology that the consumer advocate wanted to do. We've always had a rate structure study that we've done internally. So it's kind of hard to to do Give that. Give a break to one, not the other. Uh, speaking of breaks, Niagara, you had mentioned that. I mean, are they fully online right now? Are they in production? They've, they've been in production since 2017. They, they originally had two lines. I believe my, I had heard when I went to Bloomfield a couple of weeks ago, they are putting an application in for another line. Mm -hmm. There were a third line. So... Their total proposal was four lines, so they have two active. I think they're going to go to a third line. I'm not privy to their, their business plans, though. Now, are they generating any revenue for the MDC? Yes. Do we have those numbers at all? They, it, in 2000, and from the rate, for one, I know that for 2017, they did 375,000 CCFs. So, you know, from the standpoint, they're, that's, they're paying sewer user, the special sewer service charge on that as well as the base water rate, and they have their meter charges as well. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Latina, do you have time to make to take more questions? Have you? A couple. Have you gone <laughs> over your time? <laughs> <lot? laughs> 
my, my pocket's buzzing. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for your time tonight. Just two observations. Have you guys ever done a system-wide audit for leaks? We know that we have lost water, and yes, there are leaks. Um, the system is old, so we're, we have about a lost water around 20%. And is some of the capital improvements to stop those so that there isn't that waste? Yeah, there is, there is uh, you know, of note, probably in 2017, there were some leaky um, stop valves out in West Hartford that were cost a million dollars each. We replaced those. They're leaking out just outside the Hartford water, uh, pollute, uh, water filtration, water treatment plant. So we do, we actively look. As part of the January breaks, we did a exhaustive search to find out what happened you know, there's a lot of abandoned buildings um, in Hartford and some of the other communities. So there, there may be a service leak in that building. If it's abandoned, no one's there to tell. So we have, you know, when we see the spikes in our production going out, the meters going out of the water treatment, we send the crews out looking. If it's not apparent that's in the street, we start looking for it. And then how are you able to recoup that if there is an abandoned building? Well, the, the, the lost water is, we have, like I said, is our capacity, we have almost two years of capacity. So it's, it's, it, the conversion cost is, is small. It's, you know, we still have, it, we're, we're an infrastructure driven um, fixed cost organization. So it doesn't, there's not a lot of variable cost to, to create more water. Um, I mean, when you're fixing it because of a leak and it's an abandoned property, does the bank then get the lien and the bill to, to pay you back for the fix? Well, well, we'll charge, if we have to go out, what we'll do is we'll, we find the leak, if it's their internal services, we'll shut off the water at the, at the, uh, at the uh, gate box. And um, the fix is on, if, if it's their internal leak, if it's their internal plumbing that's leaking, that they have to fix their own, and we won't turn the water on until they fix it. My other question was, um, when was the last time that you all restructured your debt to make your payments more affordable? Is that an option? Has it been done? Well, obviously, we, we have taken the, uh, the, uh, the laws have changed where you, you can't do uh, advanced refunding anymore. They have to go the course of 10 years. The only uh, debt um, that we have would have, and there's currently, we do take uh, advantages of any refunding opportunities. I'm currently looking at our 2010 and 2013, um, as they're <coughs> coming due in the short term to look at that. Um, 2000, 2008, we've already refunded that. so. Given the current environment and tax, you know, the, the tax code, I'm limited at what I can do. Thank you. Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor and John. Thanks for staying late. Appreciate your presentation. <clears throat> My head is spinning a little bit. I work in finance, but there are a lot of numbers here to try and keep track of. But I have two that I think are simple and I hope quick questions. If you can go just to slide 10, 10 for me for a second, please. Uh, nope. The one with the the the, the totals that I think from sixty uh, one to seventy two million. It's the just the total increase. I thought it was slide ten, but um, yeah, your your pages are different. <coughs> Irregardless. So um, there was a thirteen percent increase on those changes. The question is, what was that increase number from last year? So from two thousand eighteen to two thousand nineteen, it's thirteen percent. Yeah, that one. You just that had slide. It. Yep, that's good. So if you look at the percent change, do you ha can you tell us what it was for the prior year? I don't have that, I don't have that right on me. Um, I'd have to open the, the 2018 budget. Can you down. get us that? Yeah, I can send okay. that to you. Great. And the last question is, I know next Monday, uh, December 10th, is your vote, is your district vote. Can you just tell us what that vote is? Is it on the entire budget? Is it on, just explain to us. I think it's a district vote. Is that right? It's, it's on the entire budget. It's on the operating budget. It's on the capital, uh, you know, the capital improvement budget. So the way that it goes through is that there's there's capital improvement resolutions, <coughs> which is you know, the last page here. They're going to go through that first. Those are all the capital authorizations. They'll go to approve that, and then they'll vote. And that gives us the ability to spend capital money as well as issue debt to fund it. Next piece they'll go through is they'll approve the expenditures by by category, which is this format yeah. here. They'll approve the expenditures, and then they'll go through to the revenues to approve the revenues to support those expenditures, and then they go through with each of the individual <coughs> rates, such as approving the, the base water rate, the customer service charge by meter size, 
uh, the non-member towns, and then they also approved the, the sewer ordinances as well. So the, through the course of the process, we had a public hearing for water rates because those are driven by water ordinances. And we are going to have on December 10th a government uh, public hearing because that's going to be the sewer ordinances or the government side of the business. I got it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions? Councillor Hurley. I just had a comment, I guess, to our commissioners. I would hope that the commissioners vote no on the budget. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, John, thank you for okay. staying late, and I appreciate the presentation. Okay. Um, and I will just say that I'm, I am worried about the sustainability of these large increases. I think um, a 7.3% increase this year is, mm -hmm. is a large increase for our town to absorb, and the 11% increase to our residents for their water usage. Um, and I know that a lot of us spoke to the increases last year, uh, the large increases last year, hoping we wouldn't see um, an additional in large increase this year, and we have. So I, I have concerns about the sustainability of all of it. And that's, that's one of the reasons that we've come before the council with the, the, with the, uh, with the integrated plan for the long-term control plan. Number one is to, to move some of the, the capital improvements off of the Avalorum, which goes to you guys directly, as well as to extend the time to do the clean water project from instead of having a completion date of 2029 to push it out 40 years so that we can, we can have additional relief on the customers. Because as you see in there, the, of, the, uh, of the increase, there's $30, $30 of the $100 increase on the homeowners is from the clean water project, and that's driven by the the consent order consent decree to be done by 2029. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to our commissioners for coming tonight and listening to our comments. We appreciate your time as well. Um, we are now moving into the public comment portion of our meeting. <clears throat> Members of the public have five minutes to come and speak. Uh, I ask that you state your name and address. Um, and speak clearly into the microphone. Is there anybody who would like to speak tonight? As soon as the screen comes up, Mike. Hi, my name is Mike Lipka. I live on 51 Ochoa Drive in Wethersfield, Connecticut. Um, I came in today very concerned about the safety and uh, what was being done about it. Um, and uh, I just want to thank the police chief. I was very impressed with what you said, what you're doing. Um, I do think you presented a plan that others here can take and act on. The biggest thing, obviously, is the is the state law that's treating 16, 17 year olds as juvenile. To me, that's very clear. And I would strongly suggest to our state legislatures to act on that immediately. I felt that there was always oh, do a lot of analysis. I'm concerned about those comments. I work in technology. When we put a bad change to production, we back it out, and then we figure out how to fix it. So I would strongly recommend <coughs> with high urgency to get that law changed. That was very clear from the police chief's comments. Um, we cannot live like this going forward in, in Wethersfield. Last week's events were very disturbing. I have a, a child the same age as the one that was attacked, and we need to take this extremely uh, urgent. Um, I also uh, very appreciative of, of the police working a little bit of overtime. I would suggest, I don't know the dollars, but if that's a solution that uh, it helps us keep our kids safe, we should, have a, we should have a dialogue of whether we should be spending that money. I would support that, uh, that discussion big time. If we can get the dollars out there and have a public discussion, I think that's really important. We just need to take this extremely seriously. Uh, and I urge everybody to, to do that, and I really did enjoy the, the presentation and discussion uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? It's the night for mics to talk. <laughs> Short guy. Good evening, everyone. Mike Barasa, 248 Dale Road. <clears throat> and I'd like to thank the chief for his comments and about what's going on in Wethersfield. And I'd like to say I was a victim of one of those car thefts. And, <clears throat> you know, it's, a, it's an unpleasant feeling. And it's not just the car being taken. 
you know, I, I listened to the legislators on what, uh, what the laws were and so forth, and Russ educated me a little bit over a beer tasting event on, <laughs> on the voting, and, and it's a difficult job that they have because everything's bundled together. But it clearly, <clears throat> you know, the chief gave statistics, and those statistics, although as prominent as they were, are not the true statistics out there because the unreported uh, break-ins of people rifling through cars is probably tenfold of what the chief talked about. Now, <clears throat> growing up in, you know, I, I grew up in Waterbury. We moved to Weathersfield for a reason. And what I'm seeing now is a transition going on. And we've been here, I've been here 20 years. It's not the Weathersfield that my wife grew up in anymore. And there needs to be some changes now, if you talk to, you know, the chief said that the crime rate he feels is getting uh, higher and higher because he could feel it. Well, it's true. You know, I grew up with the commissioner of Department of Corrections. I'm very friendly with a lot of the state's attorneys. I'm very close with a lot of police officers. And they'll tell you it, it's a joke on what's going on out there. Nobody, they tell you, point blank, nobody goes to jail anymore. Now, I don't know, my car got stolen. It was, its value was over 30000 That's grand theft larceny in my day. But now it's a slap on the wrist. It was a, it's not a mistake. That's, that's a choice they made. A mistake is maybe taking a, some bubble gum from the local store. Maybe rifling through the cars. But stealing the car is a conscious decision, and that law needs to be changed, and I think everyone in here uh, feels that. <clears throat> and it's a shame if we don't. And, and uh, Senator Fonferra said we have to find the balance. Well, that's an easy balance right there. It, it, that's, we gotta make a clear cut choice of there has to be repercussions. If they grant theft larceny, there needs to be repercussions. And I feel sorry for the officers that work in this town and throughout the state. They know they're gonna go after this in, on a pursuit and chase them and arrest them. And then two days later, they're out and they're you know, flipping off our officers and telling them they know. As soon as they lock them up, the next day they're walking around making fun of, the, of our police officers. It's gotta stop. And what they do every day is unbelievable. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I like, never mind the Democrats, never mind the Republicans, you got to make the people accountable at the state to change this law. It has to be done, and it's an epidemic. And if anyone believes it's not an epidemic, well, you're missing the boat. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up. Uh, good evening, David Kirk, 149 Broad Street. I was, uh, I, I want to talk about the NDC and this, uh, the budget, this plan, this 40-year plan. And uh, I remember when they were here, uh, was it a month ago? And, um, and I spoke to someone from the NDC about this, and they, I said, well, how can we uh, reduce the cost? And, and, uh, and he told me about, at, at the very end of his presentation, he did mention something that was uh, w what I heard from this other person is that the, the originally the plan was supposed to be a, a shorter period of time, I, something like 25 years, but then they realized it would just be uh, enormous burden on the towns to pay for it. They, it, was, it was not realistic to expect the towns to pay so much, so they extended it to a 40-year plan. I'm not sure who, who did, or maybe through negotiations with the, with the MDC and someone else, but, uh, and, and I'm saying, well, why don't they just... You know, in 40 years, a lot of us won't even be around, or, or if we're around, we're, 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 we're going to be elderly, very old. And, and uh, I said, well, why don't we just extend it a little bit longer, maybe 60 years, so it's more, more affordable. You know, put some of it off on our, our kids, you know. And, uh, and I, that's pretty much the only way, I think. It's sort of like a mortgage. You can't afford a 15-year mortgage. You get a 30-year mortgage. With this, maybe if you extend it even longer, because, you know, there's a lot of repairs, 
that, that can go on for 40 years, that's a very long time. I think that's, that's one option that they already did. He, he, that the the, uh, the representative mentioned that originally it was a shorter time period, and they extended it to from 25 to I think he said two two nineteen 2019, which is less than 25 years. But but they extended it to 40 years. But I I, I think that's one option that I I think uh, you should look into. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Bob. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I'm not surprised at all these problems that we're hearing about tonight uh, from the chief and others uh, as to the crime. It's been going on for too long. And, you know, being just a normal citizen, I've considered and I've thought about this so much. And I've, it's like it's the state of Connecticut and state legislature lawmakers that have to put something in place. I know the chief has to stand behind them. This chief probably has to give them a lot of suggestions. But the fact is, it's our representatives that have failed us. They failed us miserably. You just look at this issue tonight that they're talking about. They haven't done anything. Their votes, uh, what are they doing? Making juveniles uh, an older age? Uh, or they want to do that, I, I think it should become younger. And I think there should be some penalties from what the chief is saying. Time and time again, they're caught and nothing really happens. It's about time the state legislature does something and set the rules because they have deleted or diluted the penalties all, all along. And this is where we are today. Just look at our, fine, our physical mess at the state level too. It's their fault that we're in all this trouble. We owe so much money. But anyway, I really believe that uh, you hear me here. We have the opioid problem. We have drugs, more drugs coming along, more taxes. Where they want to, up at the state capitol, pass more marijuana laws to have more tax money rolling in. Um, I, I don't know where it's going to end, folks. But I'll tell you this much, I, I don't think a decent person is going to stay in this state for too long. I think once they realize how bad it is, the best thing to do is leave. Um, tonight we had a discussion with the, uh, you had a discussion with the MDC. Um, I noticed on the, one of their, whatever you want to call it, uh, they were talking, it mentioned some different things they were doing for holding back their budget. Uh, one thing was that caught my eye was they're going to terminate uh, Medicare B premiums to their employees. We here in Wethersfield do that too. And we spend a lot of money on Medicare B reimbursement payments. Maybe you should take a lead or at least take a follow to what the MDC is going to do and reduce that in your next budget negotiations or your next negotiations on, on contracts. Also, no spousal or dependent Medicare dental coverage upon retirement. That's kind of tough. But, uh, you know, if you don't have a job and, and you haven't worked, maybe you're not entitled to it. But then it makes me wonder about these people who don't have jobs and still get it. And then, of course, um, I think about my water bill. What I used to pay before they switched over to um, every month billings, I now pay as much once a month. How's it go? What I pay in one month, I used to pay in three months. And I think that's horrendous. And they increased their staff in order to do that. They had to. I don't know how else they could have done, made, collect, put out monthly bills and, and took the money in without increasing staff to do that. But uh, uh, before when they were doing it on a quarterly basis, they obviously had less people. But the MDC has no consideration whatsoever about cost. They just come in here and they give us a budget. 
our representatives will definitely vote in favor of that budget because that's what they do. Uh, they're pitiful people. And they continue to jack up our rates. Um, the MDC is nothing but a money pit, just like the town of Wethersfield. It just keeps throwing money in. I followed several of their projects. And what I saw was so disgusting and so wasteful, yet they've spent billions, and they're going to continue spending, and they're going to continue charging us back for all those wasteful dollars that they keep, keep wasting. So I, I would hope that our representatives will someday vote no, like next week, on that budget, and, and make, get them to reduce their costs. Mr. Young, um, your five minutes are up, so just wrap up, please. Oh, I wanted to go on to another subject, madam. Well, you'll have to come back. But anyway, I think, I, I think, I think we have to blame the state of Connecticut state legislature. Uh, it's, it's not that they haven't done anything in the last number of years. They've controlled. The Democrats have controlled the state uh, house. Okay, and, thank you. And, and they should have taken care of this. We shouldn't be looking at it today. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Colantonio, come on up. Well, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Good evening. Uh, I have to say that it's sad that uh, the juveniles are winning the battle right here instead of uh, the police and, uh, and the politicians. It's kind of sad. But I'm here again for, uh, for my street, Morrison Avenue. And since the, uh, the chief is here, I'm going to complain about it, and uh, hopefully I get an answer. Because uh, as the town manager knows, about three or four weeks ago, we, we did speak with her, and, and I did have a few questions. And I never got an answer, and, and <coughs> rightly so, because the, uh, the elections were coming, and I understood, since I take my time. But now it's almost three or four months. I didn't get an answer yet. We have a lot of questions that I got. But since the, the chief of police is here, I want to <clears throat> I want to quote again, like you know, the report from the police department that was dated May twenty first, two thousand nine. This is Morrison Avenue and Orchard, and that's what the report says. The stop sign for the westbound traffic on Morrison Avenue at Orchard Street is necessary because of a sideline restriction when on Orchard. I found that when driving south on Orchard Street, it is difficult to see westbound cars because of a fence at a 6 Orchard Street and the grade of the road on Morrison Avenue just west of Orchard Street. That's right. There is a site restriction there. And as measured by the town, the intersectional site distance in that particular case is 290 feet. After the reconstruction of the street, I guess, and the sidewalk, I question the intersectional side distance from Tifton Road, looking in a westbound direction, and you'll see that basically, you know, the, the town has took a measurement, and they came up with, with the intersectional side distance of 232 feet. I've asked many, many times, every time I come up here, and I said, all the time, can I get an answer now? Maybe. If you need a stop sign and you can only see 290 feet going uphill, you're coming from Tifton, you can only see 232 feet going downhill. It seems to me that it's more dangerous intersection, and we do need a stop sign too. Now, let me, I got a couple more minutes. <clears throat> I have a, uh, the requirements or the recommendation of uh, intersection side distance at uh, intersections. Uh, for 20 miles per hour, the speed limit, the, for the passenger car it should be 225 feet. For the signs, uh, the, the single unit trucks should be 280. 20 miles per hour. 25 miles per hour, the distance should be 280 feet. And for the, the, the single units or the buses that they go there and on a daily basis is uh, 350. So the posted speed 
and the street is 25. So just with the posted speed, the intersectional side distance and Tifton, it doesn't meet the requirement. What's going on? How long are we going to wait? They are over 40 feet, or over 40 students on a daily basis that cross Morrison Avenue at the most dangerous spot, crossing to, to, uh, to go to Silas Dean, the middle, middle school, and yet nobody does anything. What are we going to do? If something happens, personally, I'm going to hold you guys responsible, and nobody pays attention. Why? Why? It's been like, you know, nine years now. How long is it going to take? And the only answer I got, Mr. Chief, is basically we have too many stop signs in, in, the, in the town of Wethersfield. Yes, I do agree with you, but we have too many stop signs where we do not need them, and we do not have stop signs where we need them. Thank you. Thanks, Gus. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, Cindy. Good evening, Cindy Zerblis, 119 Two Red Highway. Wow, let it go on the record that I believe I actually agree with Bob Young tonight. <laughs> but seriously, I do. I, I just first of all, I want to thank the chief and and the rest of the Weather Shield PD for watching out for our kids. It's been it was kind of scary last week to to hear those things. You know that that happened to one of and I, I will I'll call it one of our babies because that's what it is. It's one of our babies that got that got attacked. Um, but I, I really want to say to the council that we really need to join together, Republican, Democrat, whatever you are, and we need to go to the Capitol and we need to tell them the youth offender law needs to be changed. Not only that, there's, um, there's laws um, on the books that have been changed back in 2011. The drug laws were changed, and they, they, they're basically nothing now. I mean, and that's part of the problem. I think the chief had said that too, that that's an issue. Uh, these kids, they don't care anymore. They, they have no fear. My brother was a corrections officer. He said the worst place to be assigned when you're a corrections officer is in the juvenile system because these kids, they have no, I don't know if it's because their, their brains haven't developed yet that they don't know that this is for real when they do something, but it's, it's not a joke. And our officers are out there. They're, they're you know, they, as the, Chief said they're getting in pursuits with some of these kids. They're going 100 miles away. And you know what? There sits Officer Knapp in a chair. Not only is he my friend, but he's, a, he's, he's somebody's husband. He's somebody's father. He could get killed one night chasing one of these kids. Is that what it's going to take for us to, to change these laws? It's got to change, you guys. We cannot continue to live like this anymore. This is not, and as Mike, Mike uh, Barrasso said, this is not the Weathersfield I grew up in. We, we didn't have these crimes going on like this. I mean, I, I don't feel safe in my walking out in the morning anymore out of my house. I mean, what, I've, what and I, I live over, you know, on the Rocky Hill side. I can't even imagine if I was living towards the Hartford line. I, I would be probably terrified because I have been, I guess I could say I was a victim of a home invasion before, so I know how it feels to go through something like that. And my, my heart goes out to that little boy that got attacked because, you know what, he might be fine now, but a couple years from now, something might snap with him and he's not going to be right. It's a very scary thing when you're, when you're involved in something like that. So I'm begging all of you. I've, in the past, I've had conversations with Senator Doyle about the judicial system. That's another thing that's hugely broken. I spend the majority of my time at work looking at criminal records. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, when you look at criminal records, and, and Chief and probably Officer Knapp, they could, they, they'll agree with me. When someone's arrested for some, something, a lot of times when they go to court, that charge gets substituted, which means somebody that was arrested for a felony, it ends up being looking like a misdemeanor when really it was a felony that they committed. But these prosecutors, you know, they're, they're, they're not... They're not charging these people with what they should really be charged with. And I see it every day. I, that's all I do all day long is look at criminal records. And I'm telling you, these people go to court and they get away with murder. 
So that's what's happening with these kids. They're getting away with murder, and that's what's going to end up happening here. Last night, that gentleman, like the chief said, was lucky. It's going to happen if we don't act on it now. So I'm, I know Matt made the suggestion, you know, what about a task force, whatever. We need to start it. And, and I'm volunteering as a parent in this, this town and as a resident. If you guys need somebody that will, you know, will help spearhead something like this, I'll be more than happy to. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Anybody else? Okay, well, we don't have too much left on the agenda. We have no hearings on ordinances and resolutions, and we'll move on to reports from boards and commissions. Do any council members have reports? <coughs> Nothing. That's a nine. <laughs> We're going to go right back into public comment. Sure. Okay. Okay. No, no comments from council members. Very well. We have. Um, oh, comments too. Well, our agenda actually doesn't have a space for comments. It has a space for reports. Would you like to give a comment? Sure. Council Member Lee, right would, ahead. <laughs> I would just like to agree with uh, the speakers and the police chief that we do need to change that law and the laws that are affecting everybody in Weathersfield. And I think the whole council should stick together and do that. Thank you. Any other comments or reports to make tonight? Okay, so we're going to move back into public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak on any issue. Please state your name and address. Mr. Mazzarella, come on up. Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. <clears throat> I read an interesting article in the Hartford Current Thursday, November 15th, uh, titled Freedom of Information Commission Admonishes Municipalities for Violating Connecticut Meeting Laws. Uh, had to do with the city of Bridgeport. Basically, to sum it up, they're discussing the rules regarding executive session. And the article ends with, in the Bridgeport case, the commission noted that it has repeatedly stated that agencies seeking to go behind closed doors must give some indication of the specific topic to be addressed. Generic terms, such as personnel or legal, aren't enough, the commission ruled. So tonight, I see you're going into executive session, and the reason stated is negotiations. And I think the public should be given some indication of what the negotiations are about. You, if it's a personnel matter, you obviously don't have to state the person that the discussion is going to be about. But I think the public should know in trying to be more transparent, that if you're negotiating tonight with, say, for example, our new town manager, uh, or if you're negotiating about uh, a union contract, that the public should be advised of, of what's going on. And that way there we wouldn't have surprises where suddenly we find out we're going to be buying a farm. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Colantonio? It's me again. Uh, good evening. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, I did attend a meeting, uh, when was it, last week? Or uh, this, this is regarding the pedestrian and bikeway paths? you know, in Weathersfield. I found it very interesting. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of questions too, you know, and there were a lot of gaps on sidewalks, on streets. They should not be. But the thing that struck me the most, or it, it impressed me, I guess, uh, uh, there was a questionnaire, and one of the questionnaire asked the question, why 
do you walk or why don't you walk and whatnot? Or do you bike? Why don't you bike? And, and, and one of the questions or the answer was a lot of them says, because it's not safe, the cars go too fast, the speed is too high. That's, that's sad. I, I, I think it's really bad. Now, the chief of police is no longer here, but I'm going to make a comment that uh, every time we break the law and there are no consequences, we're going to break the law again. And every time we break the law, it's going to be more and more and more. People go too fast on my street. Posted speed 25, 85th percentile, years ago, 31. Right now, it must be 35, 40. I guess, you know, two councilmen came on my street and they, and they you know, they, they were there and they agreed. Says, yeah, people go too fast. But it's not just on my street. It's, it's all over creation. Okay, it's, it's, it's all over. And, and we should do something. Is it because the police department, as well as they do their job and whatnot, they don't do a complete job? I mean, if you break the law, I mean, nobody stops you. There are so many people, you know, driving around, talking on the phone. It's against the law. Why do I see it and the police department doesn't see it? I mean, this is, to me, it's incomprehensible. But, I mean, I'm, after all, I'm just a foreigner. That's why I don't, I'm not supposed to understand everything, I guess, you know. But, it, but it's, just, uh, it's just bad. And so the meeting that I went, I was, you know, it, I found it very interesting. I enjoyed it, and uh, and they complain about uh, sidewalk gaps, and I say, yeah, I complain too about the sidewalk gaps. I didn't want the sidewalk in front of my house. I said, but uh, I got it anyway. And on Church Street, there are gaps. Who's supposed <laughs> to clean the sidewalks? What's going on? And then somebody asked a question regarding whose responsibility is it, like you know, for the sidewalk, and uh, there was no answer. But anyway. I find it really inter interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anybody else like to speak tonight? Dave? Uh, hello again. Uh, Dave Kirk, 140 Number Street. Uh, I, didn't, I missed the part where the police was speaking, but um, I was at a meeting in Hartford where they discussed the uh, pilot program to have cameras put voluntarily on homes and businesses who and uh, who would volunteer to have the police department put par cameras that they supply, all they would have to do is tap into the Wi-Fi of the residents, and it would cost the resident nothing. To, uh, for, and it was a very t small camera, not like the old days where they had the big cameras. And, and they, they're putting this all over Hartford in high crime areas or just to monitor areas. And the resident would have uh, access to review you know, past hours, and the police would, department would have access to the to the website where that they can check the hours and the uh, the, the the footage. But uh, if uh, that's one idea, I thought, well, Wethersfield doesn't have high crime, but maybe if we got a few of those in some areas that we're a little bit more concerned about, we may not be able to stop the crime as it's happening, but we would have actual footage. Of a, of a car or individual to, to track them down. Now, uh, Harper, I guess they, they got this program, they got money from a grant or something to get this program, but um, I know homes are already doing it now. There's uh, all over Connecticut, there's people putting cameras in front of their doorways or in their homes and inside their house, but um, this one uh, program in Hartford, is, it's run by the police department. Maybe we can get something like that. Maybe that might help, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else who'd like to speak? Ms. Mr. Young? Good evening again. Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, back to the MDC. Uh, one thing that they spoke about or put up on the screen was uh, cost per town, uh, by, I guess it's by, by resident, where it showed $98 for people buying or paying for sewer service in Harford, whereas in, our, in Wethersfield it was $300. You want to go back and look at that. Uh, and of course he was blaming the ad valorem on that because Harford's assessed at like 32%, and we're, we're assessed at 70%. 
just like all the other towns. And, and I really believe that there should be some kind of equity involved in this issue, taking, taking away that 32%, 32, 32, uh, and putting a 70 on them and make them pay for it. I mean, why should, our, why should their flushing a toilet be less than ours? Just doesn't make any sense. Uh, at the last town council meeting, I spoke, I spoke about the uh, Keisha farm, and I was talking about different, different properties that were, were either sold or currently on the market. And, uh, of course, there were five of them that sold that I spoke about. Uh, two of them were, and, and I came up with an average of like $30,500 per acre out of those five. Of course, those five were 2018. There were two of them, and that average was... $19,500. And these were very recent sales, two th sales in 2018. The average price, and one was in Glastonbury, our next door neighbor, and the other one was in Windsor. $19,500, and we're paying what? Seven, $75,000 per acre for the Keisha farm. Then on the other hand, there was a number of far, uh, properties that were sold, uh, that were on the market not sold. Uh, Berlin had four of them. And I'll just read them off quickly uh, without the street names. I mean, if you want them, I'll give them to you later. 11 acres, an average $50,000 an acre. 28 acres, average $13,800 an acre. 19 acres, average $32,000 an acre. 28 acres, average $13,900 an acre. Um, Middletown had a whole bunch of them. And uh, Middletown had them, 41 acres for $17,000 an acre. 16 acres at $27,000 an acre. Uh, 83 acres sold for $6,200 an acre, and we're paying $75,000. I know it's in Middletown, but it's only a couple, couple towns down the street. 13,000, uh, 13 acres sold for $13,000 an acre. And it just goes on, ladies and gentlemen. The town of Cheshire has one for sale, 50 acres of land at $976,000. That comes out to 19520 bucks an acre. Why in the world are we paying $75,000 an acre for some, some piece of property that hasn't been worked for years? And it looks like heck. Go look at these properties online. A lot of them look great. Nice green is being active. It's an active property. What else I notice is the town of <whistles> Reading. Reading, ritzy area, where a lot of movie stars and wealthy people live. Here you got 20 acres of land for sale for $720,000. That's $35,000 an acre, folks. Here's another one in Reading, another 26 acres for $625,000 an acre. That's $23,000 an acre. The real kicker is this. The town of Stamford, Connecticut. We all know that town, right? I've, never, I've been there, but I passed by it many times, down on the Gold Coast. They have a parcel of 15 acres for $1.2 million. That's a lot of money. $1.2 million for 15 acres. You're buying 32, and this is for sale, it hasn't been sold. And it says for a nice building lot. They called it a nice building lot, which means it's in a nice neighborhood of probably mansions, okay? And what they've said, and, and if you took the $1,200,000 twice, you're at your price at the Wilkes, at the, um, at the Keisha Farm. Okay, thank you. Your five minutes are What you're doing is you're paying Stanford, Connecticut prices for the Keisha farm. That's what it boils down to. And you're up in central Connecticut, right next door to the worst pit in the world, which is called Harford. 
Okay. Thank there you are no of these, madam, and I'll be back because okay. of your five minute nonsense, r ridiculous uh, time span that you only give a citizen to talk. Okay, well, I will be back you. and I'm going to recite many more of these because you're paying okay, do we Ritzy have a motion? Not town price for that okay, property. Okay, thank you, Mr. Young. Do we have a motion to go into executive session to discuss negotiations? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Have a good night. I wasn't. <laughs>